Eric, what did we discover today? We discovered that I am a far more knowledgeable connoisseur of mid-2000s bodybuilding than Jeff Nippert. You know, I didn't want to say it, but now that you can say it, I can double down. We uh, are graced with the Kiwi King's presence, Jeff Nipper today. Tons of insight in terms of content creation, the overall evidence-based community, really a powerhouse episode. But we, as always, not that we feel it's necessary to assert authority, it just comes natural to us being, once again, atop the pyramid. Jeff might be on a mountain, but that's a natural formation. We have something that was created from our own vision, came out of our minds, the pyramid, which is a superior mountain when you think about it and so when we graciously invited our main man jeff on and somehow it did devolve into a debate as to who should have won the 2007 mr olympia we just had to state facts eric that's basically what happened yeah i mean some some would say why would you spend that time yeah. talking about that when you could have gotten to the topic of what goes into effective science communication and how does one cultivate an appreciation for science uh, that, that includes uh, fitness and actually changes the masses' opinions and makes them more engaged with their health and mm. get better results? Ooh. And our response to that is, bro, Dennis Wolf, 2007, <laughs> got robbed. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it, it's a very important point, and that is that the tonic that we come back to when it comes to content creation is to do what you're passionate about and what really gives you fulfillment. And for us, it was talking about two now irrelevant bodybuilders from 2007, who should have won between them. And if you're not aware at this point that not only are we not being compensated, but financially we're losing money every single month producing this content and therefore under a capitalist uh, society, we're not beholden to you. You're not shareholders participating in our own culture. We do what we damn well please, which is talking about the 2007 Mr. Olympia for 10 minutes. That's right. But then... <laughs> Folks, if you just wait longer, uh, we actually have an awesome discussion in all seriousness uh, with Jeff. And uh, it was really good to have him back on. Last time we had him on, I want to say uh, to talk about this was with Greg Knuckles way back in the day, talking about science communication. And we got to do a deeper dive. And also, let me say uh, thank you to our second guest, uh, Omar Isaf. Uh, hosted by myself and Omar Isaf, you did a fantastic job <laughs> giving your own opinion. We, we we did a deep dive on creating science-based content and really just authentic, helpful, quality content on YouTube uh, in the fitness space. Um, and I think both you and Jeff do a great job of doing that. Um, but you also had take very individual and unique approaches to doing it. So I think it was really good to give both of your perspectives. And we talked about everything from... Um, controversial topics uh, to supporting staff who helps you create content to deciding what the frequency of your production should be to looking at, hey, can you take time off? Is that a big deal? Uh, and really kind of looking at how content can evolve and how it should evolve over time and how you can uh, use the feedback from not only the actual analytics, but like the qualitative feedback, which you got into to help you ensure that you're actually leveling up your game. So there's a lot in here. And I think there's some really interesting um, theoretical and philosophical discussions around how interested are people in science? And is it actually true that um, the evidence-based message in the fitness community is, is, is a hard one to sell, uh, which, which I think Jeff has at least convinced me, and especially with his success, that maybe that's not true. Eric. And then the third guest dash host that absolutely crushed it was Eric himself leading the course of the conversation that made it applicable to everyone listening, but we still, which is the way we do, uh, it managed to go quite deep in terms of the topic from a content creator standpoint, but also just what people want and how to shape it in a way that makes them interested in it, even if they're, as we joke, science adjacent. It doesn't matter if you're a content producer, content creator, or you're just a consumer of content. There's a lot to hear, I think, in this episode in terms of insights. I will get a hit ahead of the controversy right now, Eric, because right now your head is perfectly positioned between two monster bodybuilders. At a, cer at, a, at a certain point, the people might say you're in a compromised position. I actually think you're in the perfect position because our tagline we didn't decide to go with with Iron Culture is Iron Culture will get you hard and keep you hard. Um, and I think that just perfectly applies to what we're trying to do here. It's a solidifying, some would say, a synonym of hard, solidifying, solid, uh, of of uh, science, of uh, producing content, and then also the enjoyment of the process, which is honestly one of our main ton uh, tonics, Eric, when it comes to our culture. 
in order to get really committed to whatever you try and do. Well said. So join us on this crystal powered rocket ship to the moon <laughs> as we talk about YouTube with none other than Jeff Nippard. Folks, Iron Culture, I have a confession. I'm not currently wearing any pants. Not because, and this is a true story. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. I do have underwear on. Not because it's particularly hot here in Toronto, but because I think it's about to get hot. Um, we have, of course, the Kiwi King himself, Joffrey Nipples, Jeff Nippard, on to talk today about hot content. But we basically have to settle the controversy in the episode. We haven't prepared anything, but we initially started a group chat with myself, Hunk of Hunks, Eric Helms, and Jeff, just talking about what we're going to talk about today. But it somehow devolved into a conversation of who should have won the 2009 Olympia. Now, no, it, 2007. Oh, sorry, 2000. So 2007. I, Eric, you know this about Jeff me. would love it to be who should have won the 2009 Olympia when 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 the champ actually looked like the champ, not when he looked like he, wow. he melted on stage in wow. 2007. Eric, Eric, just remember, we're, we're supposed to welcome our guests. So I will yeah, say, whatever. Before, before we open up into this, I'll say, Eric, it's a well-known flaw of me, Eric, that when I see men on stage, I get kind of bewildered, bedazzled, and I can't effectively evaluate who looks the best. So inside that group chat, just for those listening to audio or video, because we totally don't have the production to throw up the actual photos while we're talking about it, but just imagine this, that we're talking about 2007 competitors, and Eric was throwing some photos, Jeff was throwing some photos, and I thought everyone looked amazing, and that's the problem. So I can't, I can't even be impartial, because I don't know who should win, um, and I don't know who should have won 2007, but I'll, I will give, like we do, uh, with every single episode of Iron Culture, I'll, of course, give my co-host, my brother in arms, the man that sits atop the pyramid, Eric, uh, the opening <laughs> statement, because we don't allow guests to speak, at least until the first 10 minutes are over. So, Eric, uh, 2007, who should have won, man? <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty straightforward that Dennis Wolf actually should have won 2007 Mr. Olympia. Um, and I think the reason why is because the IFBB at the Olympia level operates on who has quote unquote paid their dues. And there is absolutely not an objective view of, all right, who's just on stage? What are the physiques in front of me and how do they compare? If you look at the top four, it was Jay Cutler in the number one spot. Then it was Victor Martinez in the number two spot. Then it was Dexter Jackson in the number three spot. Then it was Ronnie Coleman, I think in his last, his last Olympia, the number four spot. And then it was Dennis Wolf. Mm -hmm. However, Ronnie Coleman, I think they had to place probably in the top five because it's Ronnie Coleman, even though, I mean, Ronnie Coleman, don't get me wrong. I think he's one of the most dominant bodybuilders of all time, but I just don't think that day he was actually in fourth place position accurately. Jay looked <laughs> not like himself. Hey, I think. Remember who you're hanging out with right now. <laughs> Let, let's just say, no Jay Cutler slander. Uh, let's guest, just okay? say that that uh, Jeff Nippard very briefly put up a picture of him between prejudging and finals uh, as his background. I don't know if you saw that, um, but no. In all seriousness, Jay was off, and I don't think even Jay fans would 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 argue at that point. Um, and if you look at side-by-side -side comparisons of Dennis Wolf and Jay Cutler, he beats him in, I would say, every shot except maybe two. So, I, I, so I think yeah. I think Victor Martinez should have won 107. Um, do you do you remember watching this era? Because I I do. This was like one I of my do. first Olympias that I was like really into it. I bought the magazines leading up to it. I was really excited for this one. Um, it was my last Olympia I watched, Jeff. So the the the, uh, the 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 first Olympia you watched that got you excited was the one that made me go, why do I spend my time on this? That's this is, that's this interesting. So, yeah. Um, okay, so so yeah, let's talk about this one then. Um, so for me, I think I think Victor was was the clear winner. Um, I do agree. I think Dennis Wolf should have placed ahead of Ronnie and probably also probably also Jay, um, but I definitely wouldn't put him as the winner um, just because I think his glutes and hamstrings were well behind Victor's and, and well behind Jay's and Ronnie's. Um, and to me, like, I don't know if you believe shows are one from the back, but like, eh, I think that for a Mr. Olympia, like you need to really have the, the total package from the back. Um, and I think that Dennis Wolf throughout his career wasn't able to get the glutes and hamstrings up to par. And I think it was only up until maybe, uh, maybe like 
Brandon Curry, honestly, that like, you know, I, I think that his physique is one of those that's like similar to Dennis Wolf in the sense that it's like really, really impressive from the front. Upper body from the back is really good. And then lower body from the back is impressive, but not Mr. Olympia caliber necessarily. Um, so I would put Dennis Wolf in that, that same category. Um, whereas Victor Martinez was just like pretty much 100%. Like he looked like a Mr. Olympia. Like he passed the eye test for what it is to be a Mr. Olympia, uh, a Mr. Um, Olympian. Um, so yeah, I would I would go with Victor, but I, I can see that. Um, another point there, like I, I find it interesting that like that does seem to be a body part that you can't bring up because Den because people early on in Dennis Wolf's career, they criticized him for having like a shallow back, high inserting lats, but like he really did a good job of filling in his back, but couldn't seem to do it for the the hamstrings and glutes. And I've noticed that in some other competitors too. It's like if they don't have them, it's like it seems really hard to get them to grow. Like even it, Phil Heath had you know his one of his criticisms was underdeveloped back early on in his career. And he turned that around into to be a strong point. So people can grow their backs, but it's like, it seems like a lot of pro bodybuilders struggle with the glutes and hams, just, I don't know, observation. So Omar, he, he didn't take the bait to make this into a, uh, a GA versus Dennis, uh, yep. zeal zealotous it, battle between two, Jeff's two, too slick, two uh, on unwavering camps. Instead, he actually gave me a serious response. Now I in turn will also have to give a serious response. <laughs> I actually do agree. I think it should have gone uh, Victor Martinez, and then I would have been happy with either Dexter or Dennis, and I could see the argument for for Dennis actually being third. And then, uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure I feel like Jay and Ronnie should have been in fourth and fifth, like Melvin Anthony was there that year. There's true, some other true, good... true. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah. I think they both looked probably career lows, in my opinion, for their Olympia appearances. Um, uh, and I do agree, actually. I think um, Dennis... I think he wins. I, I think he was pretty much unbeatable at that point in front lat spread, um, side tricep and side chest, and uh, very strong in the front double bicep, but his high lat insertions, I think, can be in some poses a strength and some poses a weakness. And his rear lat spread and rear double bicep, they are insane, like you said, from the waist up. He has bigger delts than, like, anyone, and he has an incredibly wide back. He... Like when he hit a, a rear lat spread next to Jay, if I recall correctly, he actually made Jay look small, which is pretty, which is saying something. Um, but you're right. He, um, he, I think he was lean enough to have striated glutes, but I just don't think he has very large striations in his glutes or very large glutes in general. And his hamstrings are a little uh, under, I would agree as well. So, I mean, it's a tough thing. I, I think you can definitely make the argument that, you know, shows are one from the back. And I think he has impressive back shots. And I think he wins, like, like I said, like seven out of nine poses for in many shots. But I think at that level, at the Olympia, you get almost double penalized for having something lacking because they're looking for the total package, um, which is, would probably be my argument for why I would t probably have placed him third. I would have put Dexter and Victor Martinez ahead of him because even when they're off, they're not missing anything. You know? True, true, true. Yeah, I forgot about Dexter too. Yeah, I actually think we can agree on that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we, we've we come to a consensus, folks. That's the podcast. <laughs> That's the episode. You Just should... in case you were wondering, <laughs> our opinion on the 2007 Mr. Olympia. <laughs> now, Jeff, I think it encapsulates... It was, it was a good year, though, no. like at least in my memory. So, so go I, ahead, Omar. I do think it encapsulates two things perfectly. One, with Iron Culture, that we have fake beefs that we basically are able to resolve almost instantaneously. So we go, yep. we, we chase that clout, but then quickly when it comes time for the confrontation, we extend the olive branch and we make the other person seem like they're the aggressor perfect tactic work this time and secondly though i do think it indicates both uh with you eric and uh you jeff so it was your last you said olympia you watched eric and for uh, you jeff you said it was the one like the really got you into you're really excited about it you got the magazines and all those things is that <clears throat> i think modern lifters 
truly don't understand sometimes how some of their favorite either content creators or people online are really about this life where superficially they might see okay wait eric like yeah eric likes lifting sure he made his life revolve around it and he decided to get a phd but like i'm sure he lifts and then he goes home and then he has a you know well-rounded life or like jeff like yeah jeff likes producing fitness content because it was a passion of his he was going to school dental school all these things and he just decided to pick up a camera one day and he was like yolo bro i'm gonna start filming this and they don't realize it's your idea identity so i just want to say that it is an honor because this eric uh people ask us all the time hey it seems like you have recurring guests is that because you like them a lot or is it just because your social circle is that small and increasingly gets smaller as time goes on because you piss everyone off who's to say but we're thrilled to have jeff back on because i'm now proud to call uh jeff a true homie because when we first had you on two years ago we had met in toronto i thought we hit it off it was cool but i've since trained with you i've bonded with you i've even <laughs> helped sanctify and protect the integrity of science by sacrificing my body my human vessel for the sake of an experiment for a video uh for you and uh you know i've i've gotten to know you man and i can say that from having a small peek behind the curtain, people often forget, one, that you're uh, an accomplished natural bodybuilder. You also had a powerlifting uh, record when it comes to Canada in the bench press. Yeah, people, don't forget that. So already a passionate lifter, um, but they don't seem to understand, and as evidenced by some of the copycats that uh, crop up, which they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but I say it's just copying. The impact that you've had overall in the community and how you basically are able to synthesize the wealth of information out there into an easily digestible way that people can absorb and then it becomes actionable because we could talk about impact you could show someone a video but then how likely are they to retain it and i think you do a really good balance of combining all those things to go to a certain level of depth that people maybe weren't ready for but then also taking them along the way so they can understand it and we could talk about scale so once you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views, how likely is the audience, uh, you know, uh, on a mass able to absorb everything? That's another question. But I think in terms of all those considerations, being truly a content creator, uh, you've riv risen over the last several years in large part and exclusively due to merit. Um, so I'll say it is awesome to have you on, man. Um, I was surprised. So when I went, Eric, just real quick aside before I let Jeff talk, when I went to the Kiwi Palace, I was surprised. Mm. It's more palatial than I would have thought. Uh, and there were less kiwis. When I did go there, this is a true story. The only fruit on the table, seven kiwis. Interesting. <laughs> did I? <laughs> I, I was going to say they're probably out of season because um, in, in Canada, they're eh, not, not the best through the winter months. Um, yeah. So I must have, I don't know, picked up a bad batch or maybe they were imported from California or something. Um, but the ones from Italy uh, during the winter are not the best, <laughs> if I can say We got this say connoisseur that. right here. Are you listening to this, Eric? <laughs> I, I just think it's funny that I'm actually in Kiwi land right now. <laughs> that's true. Zealand. That's true. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I will say winter or summer or spring or fall, mm -hmm. you can get a good Kiwi here, but you might have to shift the type. So if you like green Kiwis, like right now, gold Kiwis, they're coming into the, uh, the limelight, no pun intended. Uh, and, uh, and they are delicious gold Kiwis. I think they're actually better than green Kiwis, which are the more commonly known Kiwi. So got to try those out. Yeah, the sun gold ones are on the come up though, because you a lot of people can eat them without having to peel them. Um, do you eat the peel on the the green kiwi? Oh yes, you do. Wow, oh, the whole thing. that's that's a rarity. But the people who are everything. peel eaters are proud of it. They they want everyone to be peel eaters. This I've learned because I don't eat the peel, but I should apparently. You're missing. There, there are the there are more nutrients. There's some more fiber. The sleep in inducing there, benefits. Yeah. yeah see. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> see, I watched your video. <laughs> no. I watched your superfoods video, Jeff. I learned that I should be eating blueberries and kiwis every day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you did your homework, and you, and you found out I, that I you're you're in the land of them. <laughs> yes, and I, I should say that that's actually an excellent uh, an excellent segue because I still remember that that actually very well done video on superfoods where you talked about well, are there even superfoods? How do we define them? And then if we were to actually classify the top five superfoods, what might what might they be? Um, man, what were the other ones? I think there was a, was shrimp in there. Uh, it was uh, mussels, actually. Mussels. That's right. That's right. And, and uh, ginger, uh, kiwis, blueberries. Um, what was the other one? I don't remember now offhand. 
because um, superfoods don't exist. So there is, right. doesn't matter. You could put anything in the fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think you do a very good job with your content creation. And um, it, there's, it's, it's not just from one angle. Like I think, and I'll be uh, generous to, to myself here. I think I'm very good at, at, at the types of content creation I excel at. Um, like I'm good at explaining complex things in depth while still getting them to the lowest barrier of entry as possible, which is still relatively high barrier of entry just because of the kind of audience I talk to. And for example, I think Omar is a good job of then broadening that further. And he's amazing off the cuff and he can also blend in humor with uh, his content. Um, but both of us will admit, and we have admitted <laughs> on the podcast before that we greatly benefit from the fact that we can do things in one take because we're both not video editors, nor do we have the kind of eye or the attention to detail that you do where you make each video perfect. And I think that is part of the reason why you have so many people watching your channel, but also I, th I think, I would hope, taking things away from it. So to me, it's clear that you definitely do your homework on the actual science side and you make sure you know a topic before you do it, but then you also are good at presenting and then you do a whole lot of video editing and you think about your, your titles, the presentation, the thumbnails. So I guess, man, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just impressed, Jeff. Thank you, man. No, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I was thinking when, you know, when we were talking privately, like that, I, I feel like a lot of my interest in this did launch from your work. Like I was thinking, when I watch the original pyramid series videos, like I'm, I, you know, I watched those a bunch of times. I got my mom to watch them. Like I was just like super into it at the time. Right. And awesome. uh, I, I just think, um, you know, if it wasn't for the stuff that you do, I think my job would be a whole lot harder in terms of just finding, I mean, even since like I've been kind of doing the, the science dissemination thing since before mass was launched, but like even that alone has just saved me days and weeks of work. Um, so, I mean, I, I obviously, of course, appreciate the work you do as well. And, and that does mean a lot. So thanks, man. Well, thanks, brother. Eric, Eric, don't let him out Canadian you, bro. He just, he slapped you back I, with a compliment. Don't get the Kiwi side, Eric. I got your back. Let's go, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going straight American on this one. I'm going to make myself sound more important with his compliment. Um, now I'm going to take credit for everything Jeff's done <laughs> just because he gave me the, the leeway. He opened the door and I'm just going to kick it in further. Um, no, but in all seriousness, it's 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 interesting to me that there seems to be kind of this ecosystem that has evolved somewhat uh, ad hoc, like not purposeful, with the way science communication ha has evolved. So there is pe people actually producing science, and some of them, like of, I'm, I'm one of them, of course, and some of them spend variable amounts of time in science communication. Like I think of, for example, there's some there's some folks who just do science. And their version of science communication is, oh, I should, maybe I should make a Twitter, you know? So that's kind of like the extreme end. Then there's someone kind of like in the middle, like maybe like a Bill Campbell who spends a lot of time on Instagram, will go on podcasts, but primarily he's out there running research at USF. And then I'm probably say a little bit more than that, where I have maybe more time spent on the content creation side, but I'm still actively involved in research. But then there are people who are not involved in research who are creating um, a whole lot of science communication stuff or writing si in, in a scientific way. And not that Greg is uninvolved in research, but he's no longer like, he's not, he's not doing his master's anymore. He doesn't have a research fellowship anywhere. He collaborates, but it's, it's not going to be in the lab these days unless something unique happens, which is cool. So like, that would be like a Greg Knuckles. And then there's people who are then communicating that science to various audiences and, and each one like feeds to the next. So like, while you're using mass to heavily inform like maybe some of the videos you do for example mass doesn't exist without the actual research you know so it's just this it's this interesting thing where um, there's a lot of different entry points where science communication occurs um and i i sometimes in, in more cynical moments jeff i think this needs to happen because science is so shitty at communicating. <laughs> like, like, you know, like it's, it's behind a paywall. Um, it's, it's written unnecessarily jargoned. Um, and it's presented in a way that is very insular. It like normally communicates to itself. And I find that um, especially infuriating in fields where it's meant to be translational or applied research for the masses, like for health, you know, stuff like that. Um, I don't know that like, the strength conditioning journal is really thinking, you know what? 
I only want people with a PhD to figure out what to do with their training. You know, I don't think that's it. So anyway, that's my more cynical version. I think my more uh, optimistic version or perhaps uh, silver lining kind of mentality is that this ecosystem is actually better than it could be if any one of those groups tried to do it all. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's I, I I do wonder about the like whole like research being gatekeep thing. And like I, I almost feel like there's yeah, there's a good and a bad to that. Like the good side is that if it is made obscure enough, then your average person can't just download the the full text and just completely bastardize it in a video like you have to have some decent level of comprehension to be able to then disseminate it so it almost protects against mis misinformation mm. in a way by like putting it up uh, behind a paywall and so on and so forth and writing it in that certain style um but i i do think like for a field like you know exercise science and nutrition um a lot is open access but it it would be nice i think to see journals focus more on getting the information out there better um or making it more you know understandable but there, there's a lot of things that like i would suggest like like even kind of a tangent but like the the studies on training to failure like there's this big debate over what failure is in these studies, right? Like, are they really training to failure or is it just like failure, you know? <laughs> um, and it's like, well, there's a way we could, like if you could just videotape the people doing their sets, then we could all know. And like, that would be so informative. And like things like that would be like, okay, me as someone who is a, mostly a consumer of science, not a producer of it. Um, those are the things that like, and it's like, there's so much you could be doing to make this more digestible uh, by the average person. But, you know, I don't know. And enough of what happens in the ivory tower to really comment on that side of it. Um, but I don't know. I see, I see that as like, yeah, good and bad potentially. Oh. Um, but I totally hear you with, uh, kind of like the trickle down effect where it's like, yeah, you have the, the researchers doing the research and then you have, well, you do a bit of everything, but, um, kind of condense that down to what it is people say in our sphere would be most interested in for mass. Um, and then you have, you know, people like Omar and myself who would take that information and provide it to, you know, our audience, which is, which might be slightly different. And, and then, then there are people who don't pay any attention to that at all. And no, they're not doing science communication. So <laughs> I guess they're not involved. Yeah. Which, which is fine. You know, I, I think it's an, it's another interesting thing. It's like some, some fields of research, um, are wholly unnecessary to life, you know, and like you, you don't like you don't get to operate. There's like there's no bro science version of quantum physics. There's like <laughs> there's like random stuff that like your your uncle says at, at Thanksgiving or something like that, or or things where they where they use that as a justification to to, to mention something else, like like basically new age spiritualism. Like, well, you know, it doesn't exist until you look at it. Like it's tangential, but there's no one who's straight up going like in the same way. It's like training. Like no one is like, uh, I don't listen to the science. I train based on, you know, what the best do and, and the traditional wisdom. There's not like a, you know, I operate in physics just from the traditional wisdom. Like, you know, that's, <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's, as soon as you do that, it's different enough from the academic field of it that it is something else, you know. However, someone who is, uh, you know, consuming like your content versus someone who's just like, yeah, I bought this PDF from this Olympian. And I'm training like that. Um, they can both be successful and operate in the real world, and yeah. and one can be wholly unaware of uh, of science. So it's it's an interesting thing where you there's no obligation to be evidence based, um, but it it probably would would benefit you. And I think that's just a it's an interesting space we sit in because it creates these these very strange anti science science arguments. Um, and then the that ecosystem that I was talking about it creates these almost this infighting oh, and on this kind of like this purist based uh, ideology sometimes. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to straw man uh, these two individuals I'm about to bring up, but, and I don't think it was about purity for them, but more so about, you know, accuracy and effectiveness. But I got into an argument with um, Andrew Vygotsky and Ian McCarthy. We're talking years ago um, about how people shouldn't call themselves evidence-based if they aren't directly interacting with the research and the evidence, because it's actually just appeals to authority of other people who've interpreted it. And I will agree that probably the vast majority of the quote unquote evidence-based community 
is not at the top of that ecosystem of like creating it and doing a little bit of science communication and then it gets into like mass then it gets to someone else the highest like the most common entry points are two or three steps down like i'm a subscriber to mass and their interpretation of the study is what i'm gonna then post on my instagram and then my followers talk about that or i like i watched jeff's video and here's how i learned about failure training and i'll I, and i personally view myself as evidence-based and i think um i think we have that in in a lot of different spheres people who generally view themselves as someone who is science-based like for example um i'm gonna get the vaccine i generally think uh that global warming is real i think you know evolution is is probably the way species evolve um and a number of other things like that i just lost us half our followers i'm sorry i'm sorry omar 95 percent um, <laughs> for some reason i don't know how we accumulated yeah. them but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but like, we're, we're about yeah. to talk about retention strategies. <laughs> Maybe bring up have put... yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Brandon, delete uh, the last minute of what Eric said. Keep everything else. Thanks, Brandon. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> but it reminds me of like, you know, the Always Sunny episode, the classic scene where uh, he puts up the board and, and basically defeats the argument uh, for evolution by arguing that believing in the scientists but not actually looking at the data itself is the same as reading the Bible and just uh, believing in creationism. And like, there's a glimmer of truth there. I haven't, I don't think I've ever gone on, on, on Google Scholar and looked up research on the things that I believe to be science-based. So I don't know how fair that criticism is, but it's just a very interesting thing that we've come to uh, where most people who see themselves as being in the evidence-based community don't directly inter interact with the evidence, but I also don't think it's reasonable to do that, you know? So it's this, this odd scenario. Yeah, I feel like, you know, there are people who want to wear the badge of being evidence based because it's it is marketable, right? It gives you credibility. Um, and maybe that's where where they're coming from. It's like you're not doing the work that we're doing to understand this. You're just parroting stuff that you've heard and put, slapping the you know evidence based label on your profile or whatever to get more clients. I mean, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but like I think the antidote is to just be a good critical thinker in general. So like, even when I read mass, I don't just regurgitate what's said in mass. Like I'll, oh, there'll there be certain, it, it, be, no, like, <laughs> unless it's written by you. <laughs> then you must regurgitate. Yeah, then I want to see your regurgitation, Jeff, and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, there, there are certain, like what you guys do in mass is almost like a sort of peer review in a way, right? So like you'll you'll go through um, the results of the study and then explain, you know, a couple of theories as to why you think this might have happened. Or like Zordos recently did a study about, um, I forget the lead author, but it was basically like, um, uh, it was kind of like a power building study where you had one group train really heavy with low reps for three weeks and then do hypertrophy training for five weeks. And you had another group that just did hypertrophy training for the eight straight weeks. And it was like, you know, Zordos, I think, did a really good job of being like, there's two different ways that you could interpret this study. One is really optimistic where you say, OK, they did get better, better hypertrophy gains with the power building approach. Or you could interpret it as like, well, the effect size was like actually really, really small. And like it was eight weeks and like, well, maybe they're about the same on on average and, you know, discuss the different ways you set it up. So it's like there are different tones you can take based on the evidence presented. And just based on my experience and, you know, my reading and so on and so forth, like I'll develop my own sort of like critical analysis of what I'm reading, not as in depth or critical as what you guys do, especially in like the statistical sections. But I still kind of form my own opinions about it. And it's not always the same. And I feel like that I think more accurately captures what it is to be an evidence-based practitioner. Like it's just having that skeptical eye and like kind of thinking for yourself, integrating in your own experience, having some first principles, but still being very open to revising anything beyond that. Um, and, and that kind of embodies it. It's not, I wouldn't say it's, you have to, you know, engage with the literature and read full studies and you can't just read the abstract and all that. Like, eh, I mean, sure. Like that, that might make you more familiar with it. It's a good idea but I don't think that really embodies what it means. I actually would 100% agree. And I think you did a great job of making that distinction in that um, there's, a, a, there's many quotes attributed to Albert Einstein, but one of them is paraphrased as, it's not the knowledge you get from study that is the benefit of university, it's the learning how to think. And I think that's 100% the way I see it is that 
being quote unquote evidence based is not being hashtag science like we've talked about Omar previously in, in previous episodes. It is um, adopting a worldview of being open minded and not having this kind of, I, I guess, adopted guruism that you apply to science. Uh, but instead, you know, like you said, having critical thinking and having the ability to be a rational skeptic. And then the degree to which you engage with uh, the research is probably dependent or should be dependent, I would argue, on what you're trying to do. Like if you're just a bodybuilder, just a bodybuilder. I'm, I'm, I'm just a bodybuilder, I guess. Lost I love half. being just a bodybuilder. There's the, I, and there's no one left. <laughs> I'm just talking to Jeff now. Um, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're an athlete, but you're not a creator of content or you're not a researcher, that's probably not the best use of your time, you know? Um, so it makes a lot of sense to have this kind of uh, ability to identify people who are doing evidence-based stuff the right way, which is kind of how I started operating. Like, all right, I like the same way you described reading of our mass articles, which is really good to hear because we try to, to model that. Like, oh, I've identified this person is really good at, at evaluating evidence in a uh, open-minded, uh, skeptical way that, that takes into all these different things. It's not just trying to get to the bottom line and just here's the, the, you know, the black or white answer. Then I'm going to follow that person. Let me find a few more and see if I can get a consensus. I think that is something I found is now that I have been a scientist for a long enough time, I operate like that in all the different areas of my life. So when someone says, hey, some random thing completely outside of the field of nutrition or training, I go, hmm, is that true? And I think about it and I look a few things up and I try to get a cursory evaluation. And I think that is, like you said, probably at the core of what is to be an evidence-based practitioner. It's not the exposure or the constant exposure to the research itself. Although I would say if you're going to be someone who is producing that that direct content, like if you're going to review a study, obviously you need to read the study. So with that segue, Jeff, I'd love to know as much as you're, you're willing giving, to give us the secret sauce, because I know there is a, uh, an empire behind the, the nipples, um, is, uh, <laughs> is what kind of process do you have for looking at the research before you decide to make a video on it? Um, these days, I'm, I'm not really taking that approach. I'll usually come up with the idea for a topic and then seek out the research from there. So um, I would imagine like for mass, you're surveying this like huge list of potential studies and kind of refining that down. Um, I tend to look at like what's something people are talking about now or did I see a bit of misinformation here or there that I'd like to kind of course correct on or whatever. And then from there, I start going out and trying like I, that's where I then I do my my reading and gathering and so on and so forth um and I just have a huge list of topics usually it's some usually I pick it as something that I'm interested in so it might be an article that I read in mass that I was like oh that's cool I hadn't heard it put that way before or this is actually a really cool new finding that I learned something um or I might see some misinformation somewhere that I'm just like okay I need to I really got it like it just bothers me so I just want to talk about it um but that's kind of how I go about about choosing a topic and then I do you know I am concerned with trying to reach people so like I generally try to pick topics that are either practical or really interesting and ideally some combination of those two mm -hmm. as those tend to just cast a wider net than things that are only one or the other or not practical and not interesting, <laughs> which Absolutely. those topics do exist. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and then and yet yeah, and then from there we then I go into my my research process, which at this point um, I have you know I'm subscribed to pretty much every research review that I think is credible. So like Mass Weightology, Alan Aragon's research review if it's a nutrition topic, and there's so much index there that it's fairly easy for me to find an article that pertains to the topic from one of those three usually. Um, sometimes I'll go, I'll go to examine because uh, I'm subscribed to their digest as well. Um, and that's why these tools are just so useful for me as a creator because it really does cut down. I don't have to, you know, do really detailed searches on PubMed and, you know, try to go through reference trails and what have you. So, um, yeah, this th this will really cut down on my time. And then if I want to get more detailed, which I often do, I usually will try to 
go in a little more depth on like one or two studies, then I'll try to find a study that seems to be of higher quality, whether it's like referenced in uh, the references from like a mass piece or something like that. Or I'll just try to see if there's like a, a systematic review or a meta-analysis or a position stand or something like that on the topic. And then sort of just work from there. Um, at this point, like I've, you know, I think I was introduced to the like evidence-based community nearly a decade ago, like it was probably around 2012 that, or maybe 2011 that I found like Lane Norton. Um, and then since then, it's like, I've just had such a huge appetite for it. So it's like you do something for 10 years, like, especially if you're really passionate about it, you, you kind of know, you know, like, you know, where to look, you know, well, you don't, I'm like, like perfect example of Dunning Kruger right now, but like, you know, I like, you know, at least where to find the right answer if you don't know the right answer. So that's where I feel like I'm at at this point. And that kind of takes time, I think. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, uh, it, it is, it is clear that you've done this for a while and that you're very good at it. Cause you drop some, some small things that I think seem very obvious to you, but that are actually quite critical for others. So, um, looking at the reference list, of an article that's written by a, a science creator and digging deeper, that may not be something that that most people think about. I mean, to be honest, a lot of people don't track back references. I think that that's a very rare thing. Um, and then additionally, you said also, I'll look for, you know, a systematic review on the topic. And I think it's especially important that you brought that up because meta analyses are like a systematic review with stats, and they could be right, they could be done wrong, as I've learned with my colleague Eric Trexler from our many mass reviews that he's redone half the meta-analyses we've reviewed. But a systematic review, it's it's very much like this qualitative piece on all the, the, the research on a given topic. And I would recommend anyone, and I think that's typically what position stands are as well. There basically are systematic reviews written by a lot of authors and peer-reviewed. That's a great way to start. So like if you ever want to check out uh, the ISSN, the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, go to their position stands. They have like double digit number of them going back for the last decade. Uh, and you can find really good stuff, at least in the realm of nutrition. And there are equivalents of that everywhere. So I think that's something, uh, Jeff, that um, while you said it in passing, that could be a game changer for a lot of people. Uh, research reviews, tracking back references within the articles from the research reviews that you follow, that's all great advice. Um, and I'd also put forth that because you have this network, you've had so many people on either your podcast or your YouTube over time, that I, I assume I'm not the only one who is occasionally graced in the DMs by, by Jeff Nippard. Um, I want to believe it, but I just know it's not true in my heart of hearts that I, I'm, I'm not the only one you reach out to. But so for example, like when you were looking at stuff on RIR, you reached out to me and said, hey, you know, what, what do you think about this? So I imagine because you have a network of a lot of people who operate in a different part of the ecosystem we've talked about, that you can reach out to them and talk to them about, hey, what's your take on this? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, totally. And I've actually like taken time to do this more because I don't know, I, I do feel like um, as my audience has grown, I guess I, I do feel a little bit more responsibility um, to, to make sure I get things right. Um, so I've been a little more careful and that does take more time, but I think it's worth it. Um, so like I, I'm working on a video now that's pretty in depth about the muscle building process. Um, and so I, I spoke with Jorn Trommelin on the phone. We didn't record an interview, but I just wanted to make sure. And then, you know, invited him to my Google doc and, you know, he's going to pop in there. He's already did that. I did that. He got back to me today um, and just filled in a bunch of stuff that it's like, I would need a month to, or not a month, I would need a week at least to really read this stuff. And even then my comprehension might not be good enough to be able to relay it. Um, and I've been doing that more and more uh, with the videos. And that, that is, that is a really good thing. I mean, I'm lucky to be in a position that I can reach out to, to people like that, but, um, even just, yeah, like you said, having, even if you don't have a one-to-one -one contact, like having that network of people that you have built trust in their information over time is, is really helpful. Um, cause you can always just search what they've put out on the topic and then kind of go from there too. So, but that consulting has been, has been really really big that that's that's been hugely helpful especially like i did a video on posture um and I, I that wasn't something that i knew much about even after you know probably like a week i mean i'm not reading for a week but like collecting articles and blog posts and just kind of reading what's out there on it um 
but I, I wrote, uh, reached out to one of your colleagues. Actually, I think you told me um, about Nick Licamelli and, and spoke with him for an hour or two and Dr. Sam Spinelli, who was recommended to me as well. And like, it's just, it's, it, it is really rewarding. Like that, that is part of why, like, I love my job is because I get to pick topics that are interesting to me that I may not even know about. And I can learn about them the absolute best I can and then relay that information the best I can. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, that, that's a really useful tool for sure. That is very cool. And Omar, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it to you because I think you are also very good at this. And one thing I would say is there's a, there's a similarity, similarity between the two of you. Uh, you both ride or die for Canada is, is what I would say that similarity is in that uh, your ego is always subservient to the need to not have an ego. And I know that's an internal struggle of, of any, uh, you know, red blooded Canadian. Um, how do I be the best, but also feel bad about being the best and make others feel like they're the best. It's a hard thing to do. So I know that uh, one of the things you guys are both great at is platforming others and deferring expertise when you feel that someone else might know something that you don't or to make sure you learn it. And I think that's where a lot of American content creators go wrong because our basic ethos is I need to form an opinion immediately um, based on whatever I currently have inside of me now that I pulled up into my soul from my bootstraps. And then once I form my opinion, I never change it <laughs> ever or it's a character flaw. Yeah. And I think that's what makes us great. Uh, it, but it might make us less than ideal for holding the position of an Omar Issa for a Jeff Nippert. So, so Omar, let, let me. I, I would love to hear your thoughts of when do you decide to to reach out, get imp, uh, you know views from other people, uh, or even potentially just platform them on your YouTube channel, bring them on to do something that you feel they could do better than you could. Eric, so thank you so much for saying what you just said, because we regained the ninety five percent of the red blooded Americans that we lost by you just doubling down on things. Um, I will say, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it, bro. I'm, I'm going to sling it right back to you that, uh, this is, so I, I started doing it before mass, but I do want to say in this modern era, it is the easiest it's ever been. So think about what Jeff just mm. said, having that accessibility. Uh, and of course there's clout, there's, uh, having a presence uh, that allows you to have the ability to reach out to someone, but even think about the accessibility of those at the top of the research or those that would know the people at the top of the research compared to any other field. Like you just spoke uh, very quickly about astrophysics or physics in general, where you said, you know, you don't have bro physics, right? Like a flat earther, if they want to try and disprove something, which has been the case the last several years, we can all take a look at it, analyze it, critique it. I think even one person died not to make light of this, but they wanted to build like a rocket or something and went horribly wrong. Um, you in the fitness space, what you experience on the other hand is you see sometimes people either willing to challenge those at the top. So you have like a, let's say a grade 10 understanding of physics and you're challenging someone that has a PhD in physics, which I always find astounding in the fitness space. But I want to uh, frame this correctly back to mass to individuals such as yourself, because and then I'll answer the question. Don't worry, Eric, I'm not I'm not uh, as you're like obfuscating or what you want me to do. This is super maple leaf right here. That's what it is. <laughs> but 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 because I've been around for a while, I'm a year or two older than Joff. And uh, I, I remember when science was weaponized. I remember when it was mm. weaponized at the basically in the service of someone's ego and it was used as a tactic to convince other people that you're right. So you are science, you're the avatar of science and therefore what I say is immutable and can't be refuted, right? And then I think what Mass has done and the creators of Mass, that's why you guys get together, that's why as Jeff said, there's a peer review process is that you keep each other intellectually honest and you, once again, you're trying to serve the data, you're trying to serve the information and you've told me this before, that between the the four of you, Zordos, Trexler, Knuckles, uh, and yourself, that sometimes, not that there's disagreements, but you guys have that internal peer review system because you want to be at the service once again of the material. And when you have basically four individuals at the top of the field doing that, uh, showing that, and then allowing that accessibility. So if someone wants to come up and, you know, interview you, you make yourself uh, readily available for podcasts and all those things, then it's a confidence builder for anyone that wants to get into this field, anyone that wants to learn, because sometimes there are those walls, there are, are those barriers. Think about any other uh, field of study where can you just ask the person that is directly, you know, helming, no pun intended, research on RIR, reach out to them and get them on their podcast. It lacks that accessibility. So I think the modern era, the modern era 
of the last four to uh, uh, five years has been simply fantastic when it comes to the evidence-based community. I'm done being a Maple Leaf, but I have to say that, Eric, because it is the case. I do remember when it basically was about who can be right. It's not in the service of let's having a conversation. It was usually set up in a debate form. We've seen how that's devolved when it comes to politics, uh, not to get political, but it's about being right once again. It's about having a debate, there being a winner and a loser. And so I think if the people at the top of the field that's uh, kind of the mode of operation. That's the culture that you help uh, encourage. It bodes really well for the community. Now, we could go before that, Eric, and I'll just say very quickly that I always found it important because there's people that know so much more. They've dedicated their life, and it's almost just a respect process where I'm interested in this. I have many different hobbies. I like lifting because I like to lift. You know, that's how I got into it. Uh, it's one of those things. And when I, you can immediately identify someone that has spent their life's work. So, as an example, in 2013, I got Dr. Longschlong. He hates having that moniker. He's like, please don't call me that. AKA Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. He's like, why would you call me that? Like, I'm trying to do this interview. And that's why I call him that. AKA uh, Jacked Christopher Watkins. Uh, where we interviewed him as an example, as an example on YouTube because I wanted that information out there. Because uh, to Jeff's point, uh, the way I've operated my YouTube channel, I've always viewed it kind of like a high school teacher where there's going to be a curriculum and we're going to go over the similar topics because at the time that I came up, uh, the algorithm and the way it worked, there weren't really tent poles. So if you make a how to squat video, it could go viral, right? It could not go viral. And people, the retention a year from now, there'd be the ecosystem would be different. So you'd revisit the topic, you revisit the topic, you'd uh, uh, find a new angle, so on and so forth. Um, but there were people where you have to have that intersection in your mind where it's like, well, if I'm going to do a deep dive, I want to get the best of the best, right? So uh, mm. uh, Brad Schoenfeld, if he's talking about his meta-analysis he did, if he's talking about hypertrophy, let me just bring him on. Let's sit down with him and let's hear it directly from the person as opposed to me synthesizing from someone, let me hear them speak. And that's really where it started. That was the impetus because I knew there were people. And then as long as you give them a platform and I think a form, to your point, your initial question when you asked about, oh, like, why is it, there this asymmetry between researchers and their seemingly inability to communicate? I think they just don't know the form and the language, and it is a skill set. But if you provide that for them, a comfortable environment, man, they can excel. And that's why, Eric, you're my number one draft pick of all time, basically, because I, I brought you over to Toronto. I flew your ass up. I, I wine and dined you, but I saw immediately off the cuff, that's why we became brothers in arms, that you're so good at speaking on your feet that is a, a, a separate skill set. And that's why it's like, man, let's do iron culture. It's a no-brainer. But if you put other people, if you create that environment like Brad, they excel. They could talk for 20, 30 minutes very comfortably in a way that the average person can understand. So I think it is all of our responsibilities. Jeff does this as well uh, to answer the question and bring it then full circle. It is all our responsibilities as we gain clout to keep extending the ladder down. And more than that, putting the shine on people that we think deserve it. It's like as a musician, I'd want to bring on musicians to guest on, say, an album or whatnot. They were hugely inspirational uh, inspirational to me. There were mammoths in their own division to give if this is the person that basically made me who I am, right? Um, and so I think in the same way, content creators, one of the things I've tried to do over time, as a shout out to Johnny Candido. I remember when he had 800 subscribers and I'm like, this kid deserves like, you know, more, like a bigger exposure. He's super passionate, too passionate about powerlifting. It's like, let me like, come on, man, you want to be on the channel? I'd love to uh, shout you out. I think that's the process that if you're, uh, mutually interested in furthering the knowledge and the ability for people to absorb said knowledge and then utilize it, that should be one of your prime directives to the point that I know uh, this is the final thing to wrap up, that sometimes you just do the damn thing. You write a song because you like the song and it's your jam and it represents you. When we had Boris Shaco on the interview, it's an hour and a half long. Who wants to hear, I'm joking, but like for the general masses, who wants to hear this fabled Russian uh, coach <laughs> talk about powerlifting with a translator for an hour and 30 minutes? I do. I know Eric, actually Eric, being the homie, he messaged me. He's like, man, that was really cool. It's that balance. It's the balance between going deep, going broad, and finding what you're comfortable with what your audience is comfortable with and what will serve then that higher purpose not to be amorphous with that final phrase serve the higher purpose bros you know it's it's interesting you say that and i i definitely identify with i think each content creator and i would love to get your thoughts on this jeff is somewhat limited by what they're what they're willing to invest and what they're willing to do based on their personality um like if like i i readily acknowledge that if i did more jeff like things I could probably reach a larger audience. 
if I was to put the time and energy to learn the things you've learned, to get better with my, my video editing, to communicate science in the way you do, to find ways to, to, to keep shortening a video until it was something a little more digestible. But instead what I did is I took my big ass wallet <laughs> and I then I, I put that on top of a chair and I put a chair on a desk and then I took my S3 and I recorded in portrait mode my me writing on a whiteboard with a whiteboard marker. And, uh, and, and despite that, in, in 2013 and 2014, the pyramid videos were still pretty reasonably uh, well watched. They were awesome. <clears throat> they're, they're still classics. Yeah, <laughs> I, love, I love those videos, man. Well, I'm honored to hear that. But I think, um, but I think while my, certainly my content game has improved in the last eight years, there's a certain degree that I am just not willing to invest. Like as soon as you tell me it's going to take a certain amount of effort, I'm like, nope. It's uh, off the table. And I was reflecting on if you were to get a 1985 paper published on exercise science and you were to get a 2021 paper published on exercise science, the only difference would be that the PDF from 1985 was scanned and you couldn't hit control F to find words. And the one in <laughs> yeah, 2021. I hate that. You could hit, <laughs> yeah. And you might have some color pictures. But the format, the writing, the style, everything's the same. And I think that some of the personality of being a scientist is that I like to, there's a question. And once it's answered, it's answered, I'm done, I'm moving on. You know, and it's not important about, about the how well it's presented to other people. And I think that is both a, um, I'd say, a, like, it's a feature and a bug. Because when Omar reaches out to me, he goes, hey, man, let's do a video on protein. And I'm like, God, I know that there's a lot of people who just started lifting yesterday. They need to learn about protein. I can say a lot about it, but God damn it. Can't they just read my 2013 review? <laughs> or, or can't they just go watch my video from 2012? And the answer is 2012 video is, is like, you know, grading your, your face while, while you're trying to watch it with the content and the audio. And I understand it needs to be done, but there's a part of me that I like to just tick that box off and just be finished. And I think that's the research for me. So I don't know, Jeff, I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that ramble. And, and how do you think about that, that investment, the time you have to put in, in making it worth it. And then also still creating content that is fresh, but still informative for someone, whether they just started lifting today or they've been lifting for years. Cause that's hard. Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, one other thing that I've noticed with the 1985 versus the 2021 paper is the titles have gotten slightly more clickbaity from what I can tell. Like they, there are these acronyms, right? The matador, the ice uh -huh. cap, you know, people like, I think people are more in, interested in getting people interested, um, in what they're writing, uh, then give us 35 years and we might change our title slightly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's about it, though. Um, but I actually, and, and on that point, though, like, Eric, why, like, okay, sometimes I'll look at a study, and there's this long, like, wall of text describing how they did a skull crusher exercise, okay? Uh, that could be eliminated, give me one diagram, and I've got it, right? Perfect, okay? The diagram helps a lot, and a lot of, you know, not a lot, but, you know, a nice few studies will include a diagram of, like, a little stick figure or something, right? Um, like, is there a way that they could record the subjects, have them sign a waiver and link the video out? If they don't want to put it on YouTube, put it on Vimeo or something. It's like that. I feel like that would be really helpful. And I would love as a creator to be able to pull out video of people doing the exercise so people could know this is what they looked like. This is the type of weights they were doing. This is what the form looked like. Like that would be, that would change the game, um, in terms of science communication, but yeah. Why aren't people doing it? Well, no one wants to change the game who's actually in a position of power in research. That's the problem is journals just go, you know, what we can do is we can sit here and create an automated system uh, where academics are benefited from their CV by being our editor. We don't really pay them almost anything to do that. And then they just use this automated system to reach out to reviewers when someone submits and the submitter either has to pay to publish uh, or they don't and everyone else has to pay to get access. And all we do is sit here and make sure the website doesn't crash and then uh, just agree with whatever the peer reviewers say. And, and no one makes any money except for us. So the incentives to change are few, I would say. I guess, but like the incentive could be just like 
wanting to reach more people with your work, you know? Like, I mean, everybody oh, I wants think, their work. I don't think journalists <laughs> want that. No, that's, that's the thing. The scientists want that. The researchers you want that. that. I, I, I want, want that. that. But that is very difficult to do within the, as you jokingly called it, the ivory tower, you know? Um, and we're not necessarily trained for that either. So, for example, the average researcher, why they would prefer to write a wall of text is because they have written a 30,000 word master's and a 60,000 word thesis, but they may not actually know how to record and edit a video, yeah. you know? So, I don't know. I, f I feel like, like people like yourself, like, you know, I could easily try to do that. Like, I'm not telling you what to do, but it, like, you, you could just, you could just put your phone in landscape mode. And like, even if it was just a couple subjects, like, and then link that in an appendix or something like that would be hugely helpful, I think. Um, but anyway, that's just my sw small request. Jeff, that, you're, I don't know that you're given the smoke and gun for the anti-science crowd because the first time the videos are like, filmed and they guy. post, man, they're yeah. training. Are they're you kidding me? This is training like. hard? They said training to failure. Dude, could have done six more reps. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God, it's oh, all crumbling here. None of the studies on training to failure are actually to failure. But, but we need to know, you know, like that, that would actually be, that would be so helpful, you know? I mean... I think the anti-science crowd would actually be shocked at some of the shit we make people do. Yeah, I think so too. I do too. I think yeah. it would be the opposite. I think they would be like, yeah. oh, damn, like that guy's pretty jacked and, you know, they're training super hard, you know, at least in some of the labs, you know. Um, yep. Yep. To, 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 to seriously answer your question, though, to give kind of the silver lining, some journals do have supplementary digital material you can upload. It's rarely video. Most of the time it is uh, pictures. Um, however, for example, I think SCJ, Strength Conditioning Journal, um, you can upload a digital abstract that can that, that is a video. Most of the time, it's just the researcher talking to a camera. Um, but there's no reason it couldn't include if you got you know waivers signed by by the participants or even you know blank out their faces and that was approved in the IRB or the ethics depending on the country you're in, uh, then you could have that. And I think that would be great. But it is. It really, I think the, the, the people you need to be talking to if you want to try to have that change happen is not the researchers, unfortunately. It's the people who set up the author guidelines. Because like, so if I want to go publish with JSCR, or if I want to go publish with GISSN or IJSNEM or all the other ridiculous acronyms, um, I have to follow the author guidelines, you know? Um, and there's not, there's figures and there's tables. There, there ain't videos typically, you know? And... Yeah, and I don't. And there's no reason it has to be in PDF format anymore. Like it could just be each one hosted on on a web page on its own, and there could be embedded videos. So it's it's um, I don't know how long it's going to take to change, but I think eventually the contrast between the type of media that people normally consume and the way science is presented is going to each time there's a significant enough disparity, there is a change. You know, like so it, it probably will be a while though. Um. So yeah, back to your main point um i think uh part of it comes down to uh it, like you said um personality like i i don't like you say you didn't want to do the work that i would do in crafting the script and doing all the editing and all that sort of thing um but i love that that's that's my that's probably my favorite part honestly like i would rather like for me, it would be great to be able to like just direct the content. So like have someone do the research, give it to me. I can, I'd like to put it together in a way that hooks people, then keeps them engaged and then ties it all together and do that. Have some other people maybe fill in some of the details, um, have someone else do the video and the recording. Like I'm not, I don't love being in front of the case. It's not my favorite thing. I don't mind it. Um, and then I would love to help direct the editing do some of the editing like that's the side of it that i like the most um mm. so of course that's why i happen to be in this it's self-selecting like that that's that's my passion I, I love it um just like i was um i think i was looking through mass today or yesterday and like um the articles in there just at, like blow my mind it's like it would take me a full month to even write half of one of these pieces i could i couldn't imagine it like it's just for one, outside my skill set, and for two, I would I think I would really struggle. Like I don't know if I would have the motivation to be able to to, to dissect a study in that detail. It would be it would be hard for me. Um, and I don't think I would I don't think I would love it. Maybe maybe if I got good at it, I might love it. But I don't I don't know if I would. Um, mm. So that that's the difference there, right? Like you're I know that those mass pieces 
can't be easy. They can't be quick. And it's a big time investment. It's just like that is what appeals to you, I would imagine, more, you know. Um, so that's a that's a big part of it. Um, I think another part of it is who we are speaking to. Um, so the way I think of it is you can take people from an entry level. So let's say like a low fitness IQ. I don't mean they're low IQ in general, but just when it comes to fitness, they don't have a high knowledge. And now, now Jeff is losing subscribers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we're gaining them because we said nothing. <laughs> Come on over to Iron Culture. We know you're smart. <laughs> You can take someone from, let's say, a low IQ to like a moderate IQ, right? Um, or you can take people from a moderate IQ to a high IQ, or you can take people from a high IQ to Mensa, like super, super high IQ, right? Um, what I find is the people who are on the entry level are not sure if they really like fitness yet. Um, they may not be interested in it. And so in order to get them interested, you have to provide more than just the information. Um, right. So that is the bells and whistles that I like to do in my videos sometimes, even though I don't actually know if I'm necessarily entry level. I think I'm maybe one rung up on, on that. But anyway, the further you move up that, the less people care about that. Like for me, I don't care. Like your pyramid videos were perfectly fine. Like, you know, when I watched those five or six years ago, if you had editing on them, it'd be like, okay, sure. But I don't care because I'm just legitimately interested in what you're saying. And I just am soaking it all up and I'm taking notes. And I would imagine like, that's how most of your audience is today. Like they, they don't need that stuff because they're already interested. Um, mm -hmm. It might help to some extent and maybe maybe you'd be able to cast the net a bit wider. But like I just think when you have people who already have a moderate IQ getting to them to a high IQ or high to ultra high, um, I, I just think that that may not do much, to be honest, because they don't they don't need that. They're already interested in the information, you know, um, that, that that's that's kind of the way I, I, I feel. Um, that's really insightful, Jeff. I, I actually ha I. That sounds, it's like, it's obvious when you say it, but I don't know that I've ever thought about it like that. And that it is, it is like, like when you are pitching high, high level content, you most of the time are going to be having people who are already, it's the choir, you know, not that we're necessarily preaching to the choir, but they, they're really interested in that content. So the hook is already in, you don't need to, to, to really convince them with, with, with some of the, the quote unquote bells and whistles. That's really interesting. Yeah. That, that's what I think. Um, and on that point of like, you know, saying, you know, you could reach more people. Um, like, I think that people in the science based sphere do tend to um, underestimate how many people are out there in those those middle zones like they are kind of intermediate they're familiar like they know progressive overload like they know the they know the basic concepts um i think that and and that's kind of what i'm trying to do like i'm trying to cast a pretty wide net um in that middle zone of people who already have the bait they, they know how to do the exercises they know the basic concepts um and just try to elevate that a little bit more um that's just where I feel like my skill set matches my interest level. Um, when I dip down to the trying to take people from an entry level to a moderate level, I just personally find it a bit boring because I find like, how much do you need to know to go from entry level to moderate level? Not that much. Like you can do it in a couple of videos. Um, so then from a longevity standpoint, I find trying to cater your content to people who have already have passed that entry level is the way to go. Um, but it certainly is still true that if you want to reach as many people as possible, you will be able to reach more people because with the more beginner style content, like mm -hmm. you know, most people are still there. Um, it's just for me as a content creator, I try to appeal most of my content a little bit up from that, but yet still not uh, alienate people who would find themselves in that entry. And that is the, that is the tricky part. Um, because if you appeal to the people who are still on that entry level, they're, they're on chapter one. Well, now you're starting to lose people who are on chapter five or six, right? So you need to try to get them quickly caught up or get, keep them in the loop, like get the, get that done fast. So you don't 
then alienate the core of your audience who is a little bit more advanced. Um, so that becomes that becomes a bit of a, of a balancing act. Um, and that's something that I, I am, especially lately, a little more careful to do. Um, there was one video where uh, it was about RPE and RIR, and it was like, the 10th one I had done, like not even exaggerating. So I was like, okay, I'm going to hop into it. Like, you know, if you don't know what RPE is, you can Google it at this point. Like, you know, like I'm just going to jump in. And, uh, I, I did get quite a few comments and messages being like, I just wish that you had exp like explained what it was at the beginning, you know, like what RPE mm. is. And it's like, that made me realize that it's like, okay, <sighs> The way that YouTube works is that there are people who are watching these videos for the first time. They haven't seen my other videos. I can't assume that they have. And so I got to find a way to get them on board as quickly as possible without losing the main people that I'm trying to speak to, um, but yet not have them lose interest because they don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, so that's that's where I often find myself. But anyway. Well, at least to give you feedback, I think you do a good job because I find myself watching a lot of your videos and I'm never thinking ah, this is beginner stuff. Like I knew this and like, I, I'm, I'm often in, enjoying it. Like I, I find your content quite good and I would like to think I'm on the, yeah, the I sure. the consumer yeah, basis. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a life is what I'm saying. I just study this stuff. So yeah, Omar, how does that calculus work for you, man? When I know, I know you don't make videos currently. You don't, I don't, I'm, do you still have a YouTube channel? Currently or? on permanent vacation. Uh, used to be former <laughs> YouTuber here on a, a sabbatical. No, I would say, so that's, that is an interesting question because I do think it is a question also ultimately of scale where the larger the net that you cast, the more generalized the audience is, just simply due to the volume of people that are consuming your content, that there's probably a certain proportion that are intermediate, uh, a certain, such as Eric's one of the ride or dies that's advanced. Um, and I do think you basically become beholden as a content creator to your audience. You know, like uh, like Britney Spears always has to sing, ooh, baby, hit me one more time. Like whenever she performs, there's the expectation. Whereas if you're a prince, if you're a little bit more eclectic, more deep down, you can play whatever the fuck you want. Uh, so I think as, as you choose where you appeal to and uh, the size and scope, you have, uh, to Jeff's point, the audience expectation and then your due diligence as a content provider to kind of match that. And then I think what uh, Jeff was insinuating a little bit, also carefully guiding them, because I think it is one of those things where all too often people think they want something or this is the content they really signed up for. But you see very quickly the disparity between what they're absorbing and maybe what they really should be focusing on. So someone might want a squat hack, right? Like, what's like the one squat tip that's really going to blow up my squat? And you might be thinking, well, wait a second here. I actually think uh, if we're to really examine when it comes to squat, like what is most likely holding you back, it's not one particular tip, but it's da 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 da, da right, that you should focus on. So it's a reframing and it's uh, being empathetic towards who your core audience is. And I do think over time, at least what I experience is a maturing of said audience, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. they've been watching you for a while. So there is that assumption that you go from being, uh, you know, uh, more basic information to more intermediate, the perpetual intermediate uh, lifter. And then I think, uh, you know, if the science is bereft or the knowledge is bereft of passion. So you actually either exuding that by doing the damn thing, participating in it, the cultural sphere to keep people enticed where they want to maybe increase their knowledge, but they also want to stick with it. And it's like, how does one stick with it? Well, now I've, I've enhanced my fitness knowledge, but really when it comes to lifting, I don't look forward to day to day. And, and that's where some of the things, uh, uh several years have started where, you know, you go to, uh, Jeff brought up, uh, uh, in a Instagram post about like a mad obvious where like some of the vlogging that occurred, right? Where it's like showing kind of the aspects of it. So having kind of a holistic perspective where it's like, here's the correct information. Here's why I do it. Here's why I like to do it. Here are some of the benefits that I get from it. Here are some other people that like to do it. Here's why they do it. And I think someone that actually excels at that, speaking of which, is like an Alan Thrall, where Alan is mm -hmm. very passionate in a very particular way about what he does. He's a strong man competitor. So it is about casting a wide net. It's not like he's thinking of titles and videos and thinking like, yeah, let me really F over my audience and choose this ultra niche topic. This is going to be viewed by no one. But it's like, what I really want to do, what I like to do, why do I like to do it? Let me convey that. And he told me this personally that some of his favorite videos, like, yeah, he has barbell medicine on and he has awesome Baraki. And when he told me his favorite videos, Yes, he thoroughly enjoys. He wants to put out the right information, as any content creator should. But Percy, it was when he got more creative, kind of 
going more in depth as to why he uh, does the things that he does so like about the stones or about strongman so more the cultural aspects that make him a lifelong lifter and i think he conveys that really effectively which is why when i uh, met up with him and i met up with joey zatmary in philadelphia yeah philadelphia freedom elton john um, why when they did a seminar, I saw some of the people and while he has, let's say his, uh, knowledge that he provides is intermediate and above a beginner. If you're a strongman uh, entrant, but let's say more intermediate, a lot of the people were thirties, forties had been lifting five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. And so I think it's reflective then of the content creator. So I'd say, uh, for myself, now that I am in the permanent vacation mode, once I finally return, it, it will be kind of to Jeff's point. I see, I, I know Jeff is uh, secretly low key thinking about starting like a hip hop channel or basketball channel. He's like, bro, I'm ready to get retired too. Because we joke about <laughs> getting retired, you know, is that it will be one of uh, just things that I'm interested in and things I'm interested in sharing. And a little bit more of that cultural sphere of participation where I really enjoyed where I go down to like LA or, or training with Jeff or when I like my uh, buddy Silent Mike. So you have that. And then guess who shows up? Oh, it's Eric Helms. Oh, he's competing. Well, yeah, let's talk about leg hypertrophy, how it's a viable strategy strategy not necessarily a squat especially if you have fai surgery and how to work around that so you you incorporate the knowledge inside of it into the whole damn thing and so that changes over time because yeah you pay your dues to jeff's point you make a video you make you know the 100th squat video and i come from the personal training background um where eric i'm sure you're familiar with this uh, jeff maybe as well being a personal trainer man how many times eric do we describe how to deadlift a, a thousand times right so that that repeating of the knowledge I'm, i've been habituated to so that was very comfortable but now you see the changing landscape so the last year year and a half has allowed me to reevaluate those best practices is kind of what i did in 2012 those very viable is not it in particular what i would carry forward into 2020 2021 and so i do think it is something that what most interests you in a way that you can convey it best will be then the most attractive to the audience and then there's those micro considerations of like how do you sequence it what type of content the thumbnail the title and i actually even or straight up like that's what with jeff he was he was so sweet where like a year ago where i said yeah i just want someone to do thumbnail. i i couldn't be bothered like i actually just want to talk about these things he's like hey man i'll i'll provide uh, some insights or whatnot it's really not that difficult i said cool like kind of to jeff's point it's like um the thing i I enjoy most is being a participant in the culture and sharing that um and then shaping some of the content but some of the brass tacks of uh, uh some of the more particulars like coming up with some of those marketing choices despite having to do some of the marketing and some of the stuff with rascal is not really uh the skill set that i'd want to double down on so we have the luxury i, I guess what i'd say the the caveat i would uh, i should have prefaced everything that i was about to say is that we have the luxury i've done it for a decade I've taken the break. I could continue to take a break. I don't think this is necessarily informative to a content creator wanting to pick up the damn thing, but that's kind of my mind space, for my uh, mindset right now. You know, it's like, don't do anything I just said. That's like after, <laughs> you know, having done it for a decade. Well, I think it's an interesting point, though, is that how often, I mean, how rare is it to see someone who's been producing his content as long as you guys have who's still around and relevant on YouTube? most of them burn out long before that. And I think there's a big difference between, you know, like resting on your laurels semi-retired versus burning out. Yeah. Like one comes from having a satisfaction in the work you've done, feeling like, like, like you've got a big catalog and that end up being the launch board for, I don't know, supplement company, shoes, a podcast or whatever, in your case, Omar, um, or, or wherever someone wants to go with it. Like, I think, I don't want to speak for either one of you, but... I feel like if either one of you walked away, it wouldn't be out of a sense of, God, I hate what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It would be like, you know, I feel like I, I, I did it there, you know, for, for a long enough period of time. And you're both nodding, so that's a good thing. Um, so I, I would say to anyone listening who is interested in being a content producer, it sounds like you need to sort of follow like the path of least resistance for yourself. Like Jeff, earlier you said how the things that you enjoy it's you self-selected. You, you have the right combination for someone who has all the stuff Omar talked about, but also really likes the editing process and making a nice clean video, which, and then pitching to the, to the right level and balancing that act. And you've been very successful. I mean, you, I know it also took you a while to figure out the right recipe, but you're, you're, you're a phenomenon when it comes to the, 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 the I would say the quality of the content, uh, the level at which you pitch it, I, even though I think you do a good job of 
reaching across levels, but the, the, the amount of followers and subscribers you have is, and I think we talked about this way back in the day when we had you and Greg on, I didn't think it was possible, uh, which, which I think is pretty cool. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, I actually, so this, this is something that I've, um, become more and more optimistic about. Um, a lot of people in, I think the science-based niche, um, are more pessimistic about the fact that uh, people don't like science. They don't want to hear the science mm. or this or that. I, I just don't think that's true. Like, I think people love learning and yep. a lot of people are really hungry for information. Um, so it kind of puzzles me, like, why is it that people seem to be under that impression? Um, there's a few possible reasons. One could be that they want to keep the circle kind of tight. It's like I've got this the, the secret, I got the secret sauce, and I don't know if I want the secret sauce out there. And that kind of relates to uh, the Carl Sagan effect. I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically, it's the idea that researchers who have their ideas go mainstream are seen as poorer academics basically so it's like once some, it's kind of like once something goes out there in the public it's like uh, it's not as good in in some way uh, or another um so maybe they see it as as that way it's almost like they're smuggling in this idea that like well if it is gone mainstream then that's no longer there's got to be something spooky going there's something bullshitty about that now it's like underground hip-hop man as soon as you, you actually sell a lot of records, you're a worse rapper somehow. Yeah. So there's a bit of that. Um, but it, and this is something I'm not completely sure about. It could be something that's unique to our industry because in, say, physics, like you have someone like Veritasium. I don't know. Omar, are you familiar? He's got like, I don't know how many millions of subscribers, something in like the five to 10, maybe over 10 million range. Um, he uploaded a video last week about some really advanced intricate math concepts over a half hour long the first week it got over four million views like insane you know it's that that gives you hope in humanity like it's very impressive but it shows that people are interested in science a lot of people mm. are um but the question is like are are people who are interested in fitness interested in science right because we have the, it's like you said earlier like there's no bro science of physics, really, other than like the woo woo people. But like, that's not really physics, is it? Um, but there is a bro science when it comes to fitness and it works. <laughs> so it's like, uh -huh. is that is that kind of what's holding us back? Because like, I think a lot of people might look at it and be like, OK, science is cool. I love science. I study science, whatever. I love learning. Um, but like. How can we convince them that they should be interested in it in a fitness context, you know, because they might look at someone who took a bro science, bro science approach and still have a great physique and still be strong and so on and so forth. Um, and so if there was a snag in trying to reach people with a science based message in fitness, I think that might be it. It might be like mm -hmm. trying to overcome that bias of people being um, of not recognizing that what you see visually doesn't tell the whole story because there are all these other factors, right? Um, and or maybe it's just that like a science-based approach to fitness doesn't have the I don't know the right words for this, but doesn't have the same impact that a science-based approach does, say, in medicine or in astronomy or you know all these other various fields. Um, so that, that, I don't know, that, that could be what's whole, but I, what, one thing I do know is that people are really interested in science. And if we can get over that gap in some way, I think people should be very interested in the science of fitness because people look in the gyms, like everybody wants to look better and be healthier. Like it, it's ubiquitous across all societies. Yep. Like you can go anywhere in the world. People will be impressed by bodybuilders. People will want to know what you eat and how you train and all that stuff. So people are interested in it. And if the best way to get there, and, and if people are also interested in science, then we put those two things together, it should be a lot of people. So why yeah. isn't it? <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the question. Like, well, I think I actually am an optimist about this. So I actually think that it is, I actually think it is a lot of people. Um, but why isn't it four, five, 10 million people, you know, um, 
so Jeff, the real question is why don't I have five to ten million subscribers and only two to <laughs> why three do minutes? I only have two? <laughs> but uh, so I do think one of the problems that you highlighted is that the range of genetics, I would say, outstrips the individual possibility of improvement if you become science based or if you use a better, more viable uh, strategy grounded in actual research. It would be almost the example would be something like with physics or astrophysics. You land on the moon safely. And then with bro physics, like you still land on the moon and you actually not only land on the moon, but you land on the moon better than the guy that landed on the moon with science. So you're just like, wait, you're like, wait a second. What's this? So I think, I think the band. Did you hear that crystal powered ship actually landed on the moon? Damn it. (laughs) Our our crystal powered ship actually landed smooth. Like to the point though, that I think the range of genetics outstrips the individual uh, because they, they think that, oh, wait a second. It doesn't really matter. It's like, it matters on the individual level. But if you're, if you have Ronnie Coleman genetics, like where he competed, what in 19, Again, I'm going to butcher this 93 natural and he looked just he said he was natural, but he looked phenomenal. And you could be once again, evidence based, do everything right. But your genetics due to the standard deviations, you know, so far removed that you'll never look like him. So it seems like it doesn't matter. And that's a hard that's one of those uh, 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 misattributions that's hard to explain, I think, to the masses was like, yes, he will still look better than you, but you will look better if you focus on that. It's just like it's just not a strong argument. It's hard. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it would be really convenient for us if science worked like steroids work, right? <laughs> because then everyone would be like, "This is really, this is really good." Uh, well, steroids are are actually, I would say, a product science, of science. You know, like <laughs> it's true. There's no, there's no, there's no bro steroids. You got to actually have some chemistry involved there. <laughs> Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, bro steroids um, were the bull testicles that used to make everyone eat, and we know what happened. That's right. <laughs> you, you do know what I mean, though, right? Like in yes. in 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 trying to get that wow factor, like wow, like you created this crazy rocket, like that's cool, you know. Um, there's like a science based approach in fitness doesn't necessarily lend itself to that appeal, mainstream appeal quite as well. Um, and that, that could be part of it. Um, but that's part of what I, I think I try to overcome by, you know, making it seem more appealing and interesting and practical and and so on and so forth. Um, so I say all that to say that I, I think this idea that the reason the community is relatively small compared to what it you know could be um because people aren't interested in science i actually i just don't think that that's it i don't think that's it i I think that it's like people in the evidence-based community can just maybe it's just as simple as just doing a better job of putting yourself in the mental state of someone who is newer to this maybe hasn't subscribed to it yet and thinking of ways like you know brainstorming uh, being original and, and really putting some effort into figuring it out, figuring out what it is that's going to make them interested. Like it's not just going to happen. Right. Um, and a lot of people who are already in the evidence-based community tend to be people who, like I said earlier, are interested in this stuff already. And they, I think have a hard time removing, uh, themselves from that reality and being like, okay, what would, what would it be like if I wasn't interested in this. So for me, I try to think of subjects that I have no real interest in and think of like, okay, what might get me more interested in that? Um, Like I have no interest in the stock market or like financial investing, any of that stuff. I know, I know nothing about it. And every time my financial advisor tries to explain it to me, it doesn't click with me and I don't care that it doesn't. And like, so I try to, I try to imagine that it's like, you know, some subset, probably some significant subset of my audience is in that boat with this. And, you know, how is it that I can make it more engaging and interesting to them so that then they discover that, Hey, this is actually something that's pretty cool. And there have been topics that because of really cool presentation, um, I've, good storytelling, so on and so forth. Like I've become more interested in them. And like, I think that that's like a responsibility that people in this, this niche of the community can take on. And if we, if the goal is to cast a wider net, you know, no, a hundred percent. And when people ask me like, Hey, uh, like who, who do you look up to in science communication? I think they're often expecting me to talk about the generation that came before me of like science communicators and fitness. And some of them have influenced me, but I think like Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
and people who have um, enthralled the entire global population of, of people who speak the same language uh, in, in a topic that otherwise they, they wouldn't have been interested in. So I agree. I don't think it's a lack of, of interest in science by any means. I do think there's this almost microcosm of a false non translatable meritocracy in like the, the high level, uh, science communication stuff in the fitness industry. Cause it's like, like you said, everyone who's there is just interested in what's the next thing that's going to help me break a plateau. I've already been lifting for five years. Um, other things haven't worked. I followed the bro sciencey stuff. So what do you got? And then they look at these six six people who are just really really good at, at, at reading research. Some of them even produce research. And then who who seems to have the best critical thinking skills and the best way to put that into an uh, applicable plan? And of course that doesn't translate outside of that. But in that little community, it's like well clearly you are the best uh, of, of the the evidence based counsel. You know you you are you're the white wizard and you should be able to go defeat the Sauron, but actually it's, it's a skill that doesn't even, like, as soon as you step outside of the circle, you're nobody. It doesn't even matter. It is not helpful and no one understands and they don't care. And you talk too much. So I don't think you're wrong. You know, how do you, um, cause like this is, this is something that I, I get a bit is like, if, if science is so effective and everything, like why, why don't, people who are science, like science-based look better than people who aren't, you know, like it's, it's kind of like, it's on the one hand, it's like kind of rude. Um, mm. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's kind of like, well, it's, it's a, it's a reasonable point. Um, and like, I think in trying to answer that might actually help you be able to reach cause it's kind of an understandable thing to say in, in, in one sense, you know? Well, you know, the funny thing is I feel like, um, we're, you talked about gatekeeping earlier. I think we are super gatekeepery as to what qualifies as evidence based. You find someone trained to muscle group just once per week, and all of a sudden, it's they're they're training anti science, and it's like really like <laughs> they're st like they're still beholden to physics, you know. Um, and like when we talk about like what are the things that have the largest effect size on outcomes in body composition change, and then we look at your like your 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 top level natural pros and not because the enhanced guys are anti-science it's just it's very difficult to quantify the pharmaceutical science they're taking but if we just look at like some of the top natural pros i've never met one who doesn't eat in a surplus and eat a high protein diet when they're trying to gain muscle and use progressive overload and do a sufficient volume that we that matches up with the research you true. know true 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 yeah yeah, so, yeah, that that's a good point. Like, you just have to construe what it is to be like. That, actually, that's actually a good point because I think you're right. People have almost developed this like caricature of what it means to be evidence based in fitness, and it means you do a push pull leg split or an upper lower split, and you do ten to twenty sets for body part per week, and use a full. Rate. I don't know. It's like all of these little things. Whereas, like in reality, like there are very few bedrock principles uh, in this field um, that can be said to be uh, uh, truly based on the literature, like as a, as a whole. And so you're right, like in some sense, it's like, it's almost, uh, it almost begs the question. It's like, if, if those people got really good results, then they almost by definition were following what would be the right thing to do, which is to say they were kind of evidence-based in some sense. <laughs> Which is why I've always been very frustrated when, like, the main contributions of the evidence-based community was to talk crap about IFBB pros. You know, like, like, duh, that's dumb. Like, I'm like that. That's that's what you're focusing on right now. Like, this, you're you're this guy is you know a, a multiple-time champion, and you're posting it in his comments how you know like something about Seco. Like, go do something with your life. You know. Um, so yeah, I've I've always. I've always had a very, very similar take to you, Jeff. I just think I've been worse at it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really cool to see you doing your thing. Um, to bring it down to earth a little bit, I think it would be cool to hear something that might be more kind of brass tacks helpful to people who want to come up and create a YouTube channel. And I'd love to hear this from both of you. Can we talk about the supporting casts? Like, have there been times where you guys have had people who help you collate research on something or data or have there been obviously like if, if you're not the one who does all the editing or filming, I, I, I know that you, you actually do all the editing, Jeff, but like I know uh, Omar, there's been you, you've typically gotten help with that. And you're like that. You're not supposed to share that information, Eric. You've ruined my life. Oh, now. no. Laziness is one of my number one traits. 
It's like, how can I outsource <laughs> these things? Let's go. But that's my question is, what do you guys outsource? Why? How does that work? And, and what can people expect? Because I think, I think sometimes, um, obviously, when you f- first start, I assume you sort of, with no capital, you have to do it on your own. Um, but it seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, making multiple videos per week is a, a huge part of getting your Instagram or, or your YouTube uh, channel to actually grow, at least initially. Um, and it takes a lot to do that. So, so I, so I can speak on, on this area. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Cause I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I think that the freq- frequency on YouTube, just like in bodybuilding it has been overstated, I think, mm-hmm. um, in how important it is. Uh, it matters, but if it matters, if I think your work is low quality, um, if, if you're or low quality, I mean like, you know, not very well produced, let's say. Um, if that's the case, I think, uh, let's say not polished, um, it is more important to put, it, put out content more frequently. Um, but I think that if you're gonna make videos that are very high quality uh, and people just enjoy a lot, um, then I don't think there's anything specific uh, or unique about upload frequ- frequency that actually helps in terms of like the okay. algorithm or reach or anything like that. Um, with that said, when you're starting out building an audience, you do have to, um, I guess, in some sense, convince people that you have something to say and they should want to hear more from you. And being more frequent is a good strategy uh, for growth, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be the case. There are some channels that upload very infrequently, but when they do upload, the videos are very good and people want to see what it is they're going to upload next. And they're not going to forget because you made a really good impression with that really good video. But what you can't do is not upload frequently and have low quality. That that won't work. If you're going to upload infrequently, it's got to be, you got to really impress people with each and every video. Um, but that, that's something that I've really noticed, um, not just myself, but with like high level creators. Um, if they're going to go less frequent, they've got to up, up the quality, but it doesn't have to be frequent. Um, mm. that I wouldn't say that that's true. Um, when it comes to the outsourcing, I think that something that I think people are quick to want to outsource stuff and like, Oh, I'm just going to manage it and all that sort of thing. Um, I think it's really important to learn the tools of the trade uh, for yourself because you can't outsource stuff well unless you know how to do it yourself because you still have to tell them what to do and if you don't know how to use it you won't be able to do you won't be able to tell them what to do and like if they give it to you and it's not exactly how you want it you wouldn't know how to tell them to make those adjustments. Um, so it's really important to know how to edit videos yourself, how to make thumbnails yourself. I think if you want to uh-huh. make it the best you can, I think it's really important to learn those tools um, yourself first. And it's easy enough to do if you are actually dedicated to doing it. There's you, there's a million videos on YouTube you can watch about how to use Photoshop, how to use Final Cut, how to use Adobe, whatever, whatever. Um, and yeah, there's just no excuse. Like you, you, you should learn how to do it yourself. And like you said, if you don't have the capital up front to outsource it at the beginning, that's actually a good thing because you'll figure out how to do it yourself. And then when you do have the chance to outsource, you'll be able to advise them properly and make changes yourself. Um, for me, I like having creative control because that's the aspect of it that I actually just enjoy the most. Um, so I'll help I'll get some assistance with uh, the research um, and I'll have someone uh, kind of condense that down for me. I'll often get people to like review um, the topic or whatever, give me some advice on it, like experts in the field. Um, and I've worked with some videographers and editors and stuff in the past. And it, it, it is nice um, to have that help. But I also, because I enjoy that aspect of it, lately I've just been doing it myself, um, but my output has decreased because like when you're a one man team, you just can't work as efficiently. And like some of my videos will take me, you know, upwards of 50 hours, 60, 70 hours to do um, on my own. So it's like, I can't do more than one a week really, like at at the most. Um, And if I wanna have like a a life outside of those as well, and sometimes you need more space to be creative and so on and so forth, um, that is the downside of uh, not outsourcing as much is your output will have to be lower. But that becomes a personal preference thing at a point, I think. That makes sense. Uh, Omar, where where have you found the, 
the balance between how much or, or how little or and and what do you yeah. do you, do you find yourself out, outsourcing so i th- i think uh, jeff nailed it uh advice to people in 2021 hey we want to get started what do we do um it is interesting because i think the uh abacus uh several years ago like eight or nine years ago because there wasn't really a community you basically need a certain amount of people producing content before there is that uh baked in fitness audience that then comes to expect content so let's say 2011 um the overall quality was just so low and i also think the algorithm has changed over time um i think it ultimately becomes a question if you're a new content creator to answer this specifically for a new content creator it's always a risk versus reward of the time you're going to invest and then the potential reward one will get one will accrue i would say that if you're just starting out likely even if you think this is the best content or this is just amazing the way you edit it it's probably going to need to improve over time so i think uh, to Jeff's point, becoming intimately familiar with all the various parts early on is a good idea. Uh, and then kind of having that calculus behind the curtain for you to figure out, okay, what am I willing to invest? What what type of audience am I trying to develop? And what is the tonal voice going to be? So I bring uh, the reason why I bring that up is I actually think that Alan, to me, for a niche, because I will classify him as a niche audience, I don't think he ever uh, is aspiring towards, you know, like a 10 million man climb or something. Like, how can I get this to the most people? It's like, this is what I really love. How can I explain what I love better? Is that I've seen a gradual refinement of the process. We're speaking with him, like where he'll script it out. He'll come up with the idea. Then these days now, he'll come up with the shots. He'll, he's a one-man show where he'll set it up. So it's like, you kind of have to know uh, where you're going and what your overall vision is. And to Jeff's point, like if you don't have that vision to communicate then either to an editor, I mean, it depends on how far you want to go and like what is the content going to be a vehicle for something else? Are you going to launch a training company and then you really want to uh, siphon people over to the training company or is it content just for the sake of content? So you have to you have to answer that initial question. I actually think for a new content creator, you probably don't know the answer to that question. You think you do, but it's going to morph over time. You know, oh man, like I, I just want to help people. I'm like that is the most loser statement I've ever heard. One, I, I think it's disingenuous genuous uh to because you, you actually it's basically it's a superficial protection of one's ego you know what i mean like you don't want to just say like dog i want to be famous i want to live a comfortable lifestyle it's like i want to help him like sure let's say another trite statement right so i think i think there's part of paying that debt that brings an honesty to what you do that won't you won't know until it reveals itself to you and then you'll find the tier that you want to go and it's something also that could change over time that's something that i'll say where you could be someone that produces a certain level of content and you level it up you could do it for four or five years and then eventually come back and you know reshape it entirely so i think it's something that once one participates you might think you know where you're going and what you want to do but as you gradually participate in it and you get that feedback loop where people experience it and they give you uh you, you genuine feedback that's not always criticism i love when a content creator it's like man my haters are saying this i'm like no maybe they're actually just being fairly critical of you you might think you're the funniest person like you have these skits like you want to be on tiktok i mean you're gonna be a tiktok <laughs> star and you just write these elaborate skits and you're just like man they're really not hitting off and you're just being completely ignorant to the feedback loops that they're giving you i think one of the best things social media gives you is real uh, data either in the form of the back end of something like youtube the algorithm to show you the analytics which is very objective or things that are more qualitative so the comments that you're getting it's always bad if someone is like man i'm still seeing this video or man this guy's overrated terrible science right if someone says instead you're underrated i believe you deserve more exposure it's like they they feel strongly your current niche feels that there's strongly something inherent within this content that deserves to be exposed to more people Th- those are some of the qualitative signs so if you're just tone deaf to all that and you just think like i'm gonna stick with my vision and gosh darn it i want to help people you're setting yourself up for a recipe for disaster so i think a little <laughs> bit of transparency and self-awareness with oneself uh will really help shape that is the only thing i'll add on top of what jeff said because i've seen i've seen people i've seen well-intentioned individuals that uh tonally are unaware and then they're just in this quagmire of a certain level of content or what they're producing um and oftentimes it does come at the expense of chasing after what they see everyone else do and i think one of the uh, luxuries i was afforded when I started out, there was no one doing it. So it's not like, well, let me copy this guy. I'm just like, you know, it was the ego. I'm like, like, F it. I'm just going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in a way that I enjoy, right? So there, there's a certain naive uh, simplicity to that that now, because people will see someone like Jeff, and that's why I joked about it, his imitators, like, well, that's the formula. I'm like, nah, that's the formula for Jeff. That's not the formula mm-hmm. for you, mm-hmm. per se. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's a really 
that's a really really good point um yeah super super well said i know i know jeff loved that shit about i just want to help people because i'm sure you hear everyone comes up to you say jeff hey i want to start making content i just want to help people and you're like eye rolling in the background like yeah bro you want that gym shark sponsorship right <laughs> Uh, it's hard to know it's hard to know what people want man like i don't know i feel like a lot of people have a kind of jaded idea of like or maybe it's not jaded it's just ignorant idea of like what it's like to be a creator too like um you know you see vloggers and it's like they're just have the best day ever every day and they're like this thing's you get paid to do this you know and it's like eh, it's not that good like <laughs> you know um and uh eh, i i do really enjoy what i do but you know the, like anything there are there are challenges to it as well and like you, you i think it is important what you said like you do have to consider what your gifts are what aspects of this you enjoy more than others and kind of lean into that i think that's important for sustainability um because if you find yourself doing something that isn't authentic to you like say oh i'm going to make science explain videos now too and it's like but it, it doesn't come naturally in any way and like you don't enjoy it and you're just kind of doing it just to try to blow up it's like even if you did blow up it's so inauthentic that it's like probably not a good long game anyway for oh, you you oh. might be better off doing something that's like maybe I mean, it could be anything. It could it could just be like you kind of show your training like you would to a friend or whatever, you know, like you explain it in very simple terms. Um, or if you are more into the research side, like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, you, you can explain it in a way that's very detailed and there will be an audience of people who will be interested in that. Um, having the goal be to get really big is kind of – like sure you can set it but like it's not guaranteed to like bring you very much fulfillment i don't think as opposed to if you just find something that you're you're naturally compelled toward and then just try to get better and better at that that that'll probably be more likely to lead to success and fulfillment in my opinion yeah i think like chasing what would blow you up was is it sounds like a great way to get locked into something you don't want to do yeah you yeah know? yeah yeah um like i didn't know like i didn't know that that was going to be my ticket to becoming more popular until it kind of happened. Like, you know, I was doing it mm -hmm. for a long time. It wasn't even really all that intentional. I just wanted to continue to make the videos better. Like, obviously I was trying to reach people, but like, I never would have thought that I'd have the audience that I have now. I still find it kind of surprising in some ways. So it's sort of like, you know, and, and even for me now at this point, like, I don't have a goal. I actually, as much as I said on this, like, I don't really have a goal of trying to reach a lot of people. I think it would be cool to do it because I, 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 I don't know. I think it is cool when you get more people uh, interested in that stuff. But like my goal for me right now is to just make the best videos I can. Like, I just want to cool. make them really, really good and make videos that I would want to watch, or at least like, I think I would watch my videos now. Um, but I would probably really like them me five six years ago and that's the type of person that i want to make videos for um that's a question i want to ask you jeff this, this is a tough one i'm gonna i'm gonna throw you a in, and i need an authentic answer i'm gonna pitch this this curveball right down the pipe which is not the way a curveball works and you can tell i don't watch sports <laughs> um <laughs> so if the round tables you were doing in say 2014 um if those had produced the uh the the same response and audience and generated the same subscriber base as to the uh, compared to what you're doing now which which seems distinctly different to me it's not completely different it's still like the same um it's still good quant content it's still evidence-based it's still p talking about resistance training so it's obviously not like a huge departure but i think it is different it's 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 not as long form and it's not as pitched to the advanced lifter um if that had gotten you the followers you have today do you think you'd still be doing that type of content um, I'd, I'd probably do it more often. Yeah. Um, I probably, I probably would do it more often. Um, but I do, I, I, I would, I don't think I would exclusively do that. Like, I think because I really do enjoy the style of videos that I make. Um, and I've, I've gotten better at detaching the worth of the video or what the fulfillment I get out of the video from the performance of the video, because that sets you up for some really weird expectations and like oh. i don't think that's a really healthy way to be um but i do i do think i would i think i like 
I'm human and like the the way the incentives work on these platforms are to drive you to want to reach more people and like as much as you can say like you know okay like I just want to make good videos which is true like I, it doesn't mean I also don't care about how many people watch them obviously right um, so I, I do care um, but I do still do some roundtables last month I did one on P ratios um, it's on my podcast channel but it's still got like you know 60 70 thousand views and like that was a type of video that was pitched to advanced people it was super not practical and super nerdy <laughs> but like it was two hours or three hours or something about bulking where we didn't really talk about bulking but i don't know people seem to really like it i enjoyed hosting it um but yeah it, it is in some ways unfortunate that like you there, there is this system on youtube where you do get pigeonholed into doing a type of content and that's what people expect from you and then when you go outside of it people assume that this is all that jeff is ever going to do for the rest of time now like you get one interview and it's like when did you start doing only interviews or it's like are you ever going to do the science videos again or like you do one vlog and it's like oh this is a vlog channel now <laughs> you know <laughs> and that's the way it is so like yeah i i don't know you you do kind of maybe maybe in that alternate reality like maybe i would just do round tables now and i, I would probably what i probably might have happened was i probably would have just found a way to dress them up and like make them cool with the editing and that kind of thing, which is something I've actually thought about for a long time. Like I, a goal of mine, you know, five to 10 year goal is to do like a really, uh, a really cool, well-produced documentary about the science of getting jacked, you know, like an hour, like long form, but it's like really, really good. And it takes like a year to, to make, you know, Spielberg baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe it'd be something more like that or a podcast that is, you know, there there are podcasts that I look up to or I watch that like inspire or I listen to that inspire me like um, science versus and like, um, you know, these uh, th th that would be it. Yeah, <laughs> um, that like they they weave the information together in such a way that's like it's it's really attention grabbing, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe something like that. But that's the side of it that I really like. So I don't know, I feel like over time, it probably would have evolved to some extent anyway. I appreciate that. I think that was a very, very honest answer too, and, and I think that was very insightful. Um, Omar, if if not doing videos, like you have been today, grew your audience, would you have continued to not make videos? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's so funny. I'll, I'll just share this in a very abstract way. And I'll say we all should be aware of the emergence, uh, impending emergence of Jeff Rogan is what I heard from that because he's going to take a look at the forum. <laughs> and then it's like, look, man, you're just going to have the most qualified guests and you're going to ask them about DMT. So it's someone to talk about something completely <laughs> different. And then you're just going to shoehorn exactly what you want to talk about about so talk to me about rpe and it's like someone on nutritional habits they're like oh god here we go again yeah <laughs> jamie Every pull that up just back to rpe <laughs> that's my dmt <laughs> um what, what i'd say uh, eric uh, half jokingly is that i reached the point so the pandemic happened and it uh, caused me to uh completely look at all the systems all the things i was doing because it kind of when you just have things on and you go 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 i remember when i pitched you actually iron culture and you were gracious enough to uh, accept it. It was one of those things where almost every year I was adding something else to do. So uh, let's get a shoe company. Let's get a training company. Let's do a supplement company. Let's do a apparel company. Like Let's do this. Let's do that, right? Um, that it caused a time for reflection. And then I was able to basically uh, grow um, the apparel, so like the rascal apparel part, to become uh, independent enough from deriving any income or anything from YouTube Um where it caused the pause for reflection. It's like, okay, what is then ultimately going to be the go goal of the YouTube? If it's devoid, if YouTube basically, yeah, it could help, I suppose, for something like uh, my main businesses. But if it's really just like secondary, tertiary, it's not a huge factor. So it's, it's independent from where I accrue my personal uh, wealth uh, than what I want to do. And that's actually produced with also the lockdown, honestly, has produced that gap to reflect enough in terms of the things that I want. And I'm actually going to double down on my laziness 
or there's a people that I want to get for uh, videography and certain ideas I have and whatnot to execute that have been long standing. But the uh, simple uh, barrier has been one of just absolute sloth, uh, almost being torpid uh, in my uh, default nature. Um, to do it, then now the good part is that now that it's bereft of any direct goal, and I know that sounds kind of funny, that you just make the content because once again, you enjoy it. So I think sometimes if you don't take the pause, you're just caught in that system of perpetually producing something. And I think once again, some of those systems that were there in 2011 aren't as relevant in 2021. I still, one of the things I do enjoy, like, you know, is the producing of said content and seeing the impact. I think I'm one of the people from, from the training background that the thing I derive uh, the most enjoyment from is seeing the genuine utility of some of the content produced. Like, man, you uh, you know, you either changed my life in like this way, I was following this thing. I think one of the arguments, by the way, to be had for science is not necessarily the magnitude of impact, which certainly can be a factor such as like if you're more evidence-based or like you might get 5% more gains. I'm just, you know, bullshitting in here. But actually it's, I think nutrition has done a very good job Sometimes too overly marketed, but it's the ease with which one can achieve particular goals. Where it's like, oh, you you think you need eight meals mm-hmm. a day? You think you only need uh, 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 these foods? It's like, what if I was to tell you that actually that's not necessarily true? So, a challenging beliefs, I think, is one of the uh, higher utilities. But uh, I would say that getting back to uh, to do the damn thing because you enjoy it, and now from doing it for a decade, one of the coolest things, Eric, is there's this guy, uh, Nicholas Verhoeven. He's like one of maybe a dozen. This kid, I call him a kid. He's just like four years younger than me, but he started watching it as a 16 year old. He has a PhD now, and like he wrote uh, whatever, like a, a like a very nice things we've exchanged stuff where he's like, you were the inspiration, this and that. Not trying to get ego it out, but it's like the, seeing the impact and kind of the. Uh, uh, what do you say? The size that gradually grows over time to the next generation, not trying to age myself out here, has been cool. Knowing that you can help positively, potentially, and negatively, like, shit, maybe some of the content was hard, hot garbage, uh, <laughs> impact the society. Like, you got you to you accept them all. Like, the good shit you produce, and I was like, ooh, I really shouldn't have done that. Like, ooh, that video on mobility, I don't know about that. And I think I think that is important for transparency to show, like, you don't get that shit right all the time. Has has been one of the cool things. So, yeah, yeah, man. We'll, we'll keep not producing content for a little while, <laughs> and then as things open up, and, you know, Jeff has the Kiwi Palace, I'm going to have the, uh, the, the Rascal Dumpster. Um, is what we're gonna do, <laughs> which will be the, the training pad. Yeah, we'll get shit started. I actually, actually, really appreciate that answer because I think um, being around long enough, you do get to reflect on 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 certain things and and make sure that you're still going in the direction you want to go. Yeah. Which kind of ties into where I was saying, if you just follow the path towards what you think will get you blowing up or success, uh, can quickly burn you out, and it can leave you into a place where you're then kind of lost. It's like, well. I am successful or to whatever degree that is, but I don't want to do this. And I think that leads towards more complete abandonment rather than a, a self reexamination and a push in a, you know, slightly angled direction. So yeah, no, that, that's really, really interesting. And, and, and just to, I think to give you maybe some, uh, some, some, some fist bumpage, Omar, I think you probably have very few people who look back and go, yeah, you really negatively impacted me. But I think <laughs> that's, why, all... that's why I was laughing at that, because I was like, I, yeah. the, the self-deprecating YouTuber and... <laughs> read exactly. too many troll comments. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit, what, what have I do. done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like... Activity bias for victims to it. <laughs> Little did you know the troll was just me on my burner account the whole time. <laughs> I knew the difference. <laughs> it didn't impact me at all. Manly, <laughs> many sleepless nights on my behalf. Like me just think, oh, man, I this guy said he tried my squat advice and his squat went down like what am i doing <laughs> yeah, five PRs he, he just wants your attention like... bro like I, I swear like yeah a lot of people overstate how much trolls are are trolls and like sometimes feedback is good feedback but like man people will backpedal like crazy on the internet bro like they'll be like you know this is bullshit like you yeah ruined my squat or whatever and then you're like oh man tell me about that and they're like i i think it was just a bad day (laughs) (laughs) that happens so absolutely i think we can all look back and find something we didn't appreciate in our content and i think it is good to to see that so you can progress like there's a video of me talking about anterior pelvic tilt um, in 2012 with Matt Ogus, and I'm just like, I can't remember that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm not even sure that's a real diagnosis or thing today, you know? Like, <laughs> I think I remember that. And I, but I do think that in that video, you were kind of tongue in cheek though. Like, I don't, 
I don't know, maybe not, but I. Oh no! Yes, I was. I've never been wrong. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, Eric, yeah, that's but... a problem with having a reputation. You have something to uphold. <laughs> if you establish like a hey, low barrier to entry, you're always good. Actually, that is something I do want to talk about is I think both of you have done a very good job of never getting caught in what is a very common thing on YouTube, which is chasing controversy as a way to get an audience. And I mean, some people like that's not even a method to then try to launch something from it. It's the entire ship, you know, like, like all they do is comment on other people, <laughs> which, um, which is, it's just crazy to me. And I think both of you, I mean, Omar, I would even say that you have been uh, a commentator on some of things that, that, that are controversial, but I've never seen you do something where I looked at him like, God, what is he doing? Like, you know, why is he but I've watched like, or not even that, but just why is, why is he, you know, like this old saying, like if you, if you roll in the mud with pigs, you know, like, I don't remember the saying, but you know what I'm saying? You yeah, become a pig or whatever. You both get dirty and the pig loves it. Exactly. That's the one. Thank you. My my version of that was just essentially that you just rolled in the mud and I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds, like not, sounds not fun, which it is. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want mud, so don't do that. I got a great, great visual saying, image. Eric. <laughs> mud yes, rest, mud wrestling. For mud the boys. wrestling with Eric Helms and pigs. Yep. Um, so anyway, I guess I, I would love to get your guys' take on that because in my perspective, and I'm sure I'm, I don't represent the typical audience on YouTube, but when I see someone I previously respected who I thought was intelligent get mired in one of these like ridiculous call out debates or something like that, I am almost never able to take them seriously again from that point. Uh, it's got to be like years or some kind of public thing that, that obviously changes about them or I need to have a personal relationship with them. And I don't know if it's the same way on YouTube, but I'm sure there's plenty of people who watch some of these channels and they don't respect the person they're watching they're just an entertaining, you know? So how do you guys keep it to your, your, your version of professional? Cause I'm sure if I, if I told Omar, he was professional, some part of his inner soul would throw up <laughs> and he would argue with me about it. But I guess, how do you keep it authentic and not find yourself drawn into some of the, the nonsense? Um, honestly, like for me, I just don't, I just don't want to be a part of it. Like, I just don't enjoy that to be honest. Like it, it's, it kind of makes me I guess uncomfortable in one sense, like I don't need to do that. Like, I don't think anyone really needs to do that, but like, it does kind of seem like, um, a lot of it is just bottom of the barrel content, like natty or nots. It's like, I don't really see any value in that kind of stuff. So I don't consume it myself. And like I said, I make content that I would want to watch. So it's like that, that's kind of, it just seems like an easy, a potentially easy way out. But even then, I, I don't think anyone can just make a controversial video and blow up either. So it's like, I don't know. And then, yeah, it's like, I don't want that drama because it's like, it just ends up being a back and forth anyway. Um, and n no part of that process sounds enjoyable to me. So if I'm going to, quote unquote collaborate i would rather collaborate with someone who like i can get value out of directly you know so i don't know Th that just doesn't it, it i can't think if i've done a controversial like call out video or anything like that i don't think so like i've done a couple of videos like responding to athlean x but it, I, like i've messaged him ahead of time it's like here's what i'm going to talk about like i just want you to know and like i actually agree with you for half the video kind of thing so it's like very respectful um outside of that i don't think I've ever really done that and doesn't doesn't appeal to me I don't know it just mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't it's not that it's not that ugh, whatever I, I'm also not like trying to play the like moral high ground like it's terrible to do like a call out video where you call out bullshit like that's that's also fine and it can probably be tastefully done um but my preference is to just put out information that is good and like Honestly, that is as much from a just, I'm just not interested in getting involved with calling people out as it is like, I think this is like, this is the pure way to create content or whatever. Right. Man. That makes sense. Little, little did Jeff know that when we were training several <laughs> months ago, I was trying to get our asses injured to film the most epic of videos of us in the hospital. I was chasing that juicy controversy, just going, having us go to RP11. He's like, hey, man, this set feels pretty tough. I'm like, no, 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 let's keep going. I think this feels pretty good. Um, so unfortunately, it didn't happen You wanted yet. that Stallone and Schwarzenegger exactly. pick in, in, in the thumbs up yeah. in the hospital. Yeah. So you're probably wondering how we ended up here. Would be the start of the video. Like, come on. It, it sells itself. 
Uh, I, would, I would say, interesting enough, I, I would say I'm very comfortable with confrontation in person. In fact, not that I enjoy it or anything, but it's been a rewiring online because then there's the social function of it, the, the potential... Uh, not only utilization, but then the predatory nature that tends to occur. Meaning that if I don't agree with someone in person and there's like no cameras on, I have no problem saying that, discussing it. Also trying to open some sort of dialogue as as opposed to completely uh, avoiding the issue. I think occasionally with potentially, let's say in quotations, controversial topics, it almost might be, it might serve as uh, a potential possibility to bridge one of the gaps, one of the the uh, places that we see where there's a big difference of opinion. And so to see if there's some sort of common ground, because it is going to be the case, fitness or elsewhere, where there are probably two diametrically opposed camps, and you could hopefully have some sort of understanding rather than becoming further entrenched. So there can be utility there. In general, I also online because it's just not worth that. Like, who wants that smoke? And not only the smoke, but it's like, is that what you want to be known for? Do you want to be basically a gossip channel? Like, oh, like wait, here's the latest salacious gossip. Like, let's report on it. I do see the function from being, let's say, I'd be like a steward of Gondor. Okay, Theoden here with Faramir. I'm gonna burn that. I'm gonna burn my son alive with me. We're burning the whole thing down. Let's do it. Is that as a steward, is basically a custodian who's been here for a long time. Um, I think occasionally it becomes important to weigh your opinion because it's something that's respected and trusted to be kind of like I joke the moniker on Instagram I had for a while, the assassin of kings. And nobody wants that responsibility of leading the monarchy. Like who wants that? But occasionally kind of just correcting the correcting the course of the fitness space, I have found sometimes necessary. So there's a few examples I could think of where I'd say there's someone saying something pretty problematic that's going unchecked. Like let's just say a viewpoint where you could see the downstream effects and either everyone's too scared to speak out or the person is just too big. Like they're, they're, they have so much of a gravity on their own. And this would be seven or eight years ago where no one would be willing to take a position because one, the person's also respected in another way. So no matter what you know, basically from this confrontation, nothing good's going to come from it. So I think that's where opening up dialogue and also making your intentions clear and trying to avoid uh, addressing something controversial for sake of accruing, uh, once again, um, uh, more popularity. It, it, it's a fine balance. So it's, you know, when you try and uh, walk. But to the point, Eric, we actually had a you on where I was there also with Alan, where at the time there's something robert ober said you know just about the devil nothing yep. nothing no shade against robert but just because it went it, i thought it became it was important to address that topic and of course as it, with anything that could potentially be viewed by a lot of people uh turn off the monetization because like i don't want to make money from this but it's like i i do though one, once there's that cultural zeitgeist of like five million people watch that video and like the net effect and this is no insult to robert it's the way the clip was clipped is that people would be on mass potentially misinformed on the topic so hey let's talk about this let's talk about like hey we understand your perspective here is actually like just to give some greater context to this so if you're tuning into this here are some things that you should know about right and so we rarely do that but sometimes i think there is a utility and it is a fine balance because otherwise yeah devolving into basically that their gossip channel i got news for you i've been around for 11 years they never last a long time because you're always chasing the latest thing and it's not you or the content or the directive that you're trying to uh, uh, help people with, it's really people basically just want to hear about shit. They want to make themselves feel better. And so it's like, what's actually the tonal center of the content? So that, that's been the tricky balance. But yeah, that's what yeah. I'd say. I also like, I don't shy away from content just because I think it'll be controversial. Like um, when I did that posture video, I was bracing myself hard. Like I actually thought, because I am i didn't take like, a completely nihilist or like defeatist stance on posture. Like I said, it does matter in certain contexts, but just that, um, I think, you know, many people tend to rank it too high on the, uh, the, the pain contributing ladder, so to speak. Um, it's pro it probably doesn't contribute to pain as much as people think it does. And I was like, I know that there are entire disciplines and businesses around exactly that premise. So I would like brace really hard for that one. Um, and it ended up not being that controversial. Like people were like, huh, no, you make some reasonable points there. Like that's, that's kind of fine. Um, and then there are other videos, like I did a video on 
the vegan diet. And I knew that would be really controversial. And it was like, it was super controversial, dislike to hell. And like, you know, had lots of videos made about it. And that was controversial. And yeah, that like, I've done the keto diet, like those videos. And lots of my videos are controversial for different reasons. Um, but the specific type of content that's like valueless controversy, I just have no interest in it. So it's like, yeah, I'm not going to make it just to get views when I can I can get views making a topic that I actually care about. So <laughs> I'm obviously going to opt for the latter. <laughs> no, I think you guys both made some very important distinctions. There are some topics that are controversial because there is misunderstandings about them or there are camps in them. And I think um, I've, I've also been very comfortable making, I mean, I, I remember when it was controversial to suggest that perhaps energy balance and uh you know macronutrients was more important than the actual foods themselves um and that was never well received but i had no issue with that because i wasn't actually seeking out a personal beef with someone or calling a person out um which i think is an important distinction you made jeff and then i think omar you actually pointed out sometimes you do need to call out maybe not the person per se but the claim made or something they did and you actually do need to name them or refer to it but it's for the purpose of trying to better inform the community rather than for the purpose of going, you know, what's hot, you know, what will blow me up. Um, so I think uh, I think those are both very important distinctions. Um, and I think we can you, you can see the difference in, in where those channels eventually go that, that walk that line or don't walk that line. Eric, just real quick. But Omar, are you going to say? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Just so you know, with, with all that being said, right. Um, I was prepared in 2019 when you competed at, you know, what what could only be described as probably the largest natural bodybuilding show that has ever been produced. I was there, right? The yeah, yeah, Jeff, I don't know if you're aware of this. The 2019 River City Royal Rumble Classic. Um, I had a video prepared. You didn't know this because I was at Mike's house. You're getting prepared, of course, for the show. I had filmed a 20 minute hit piece on the organization, the institution, the judges, <laughs> the judging criteria, the, the lighting being like. I had basically. I was ready for that smoke, Eric. And I was ready just to drop that hot video, but you won, so it, it all became like it wasn't necessary. But I was ready. <laughs> I appreciate that, Omar. Thank you. Oh yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I was ready to make them all look terrible for you. <laughs> That's great. That would have been great for my career. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> you then you no, have to make a nothing video helps you succeed yourself. in natural bodybuilding by you know not not placing as well as you want and then destroying the entire natural bodybuilding industry online. Then you got to create a video uh, distancing yourself from me saying iron culture is going in a new direction. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a yeah. whole headache for you then. Yeah, it would it would have created a lot of work. So I appreciate that. That uh, I guess I'm glad I won. I yeah, yeah but, great so, you won. Yep. Great you won, dude. <laughs> well, hey, uh, I think we we we've we've covered a lot of ground. I want to be respectful of your time, Jeff. Um, I want to open it up just because I am not a successful YouTuber by any means. I'm sure I have blind spots as to what might be worth talking about. Is there anything that either one of you want to touch base on uh, before we, 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 we close this circle? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say I feel terrible because Jeff thought this podcast wasn't going to go for two hours, so he didn't turn the light on behind him because he's also on Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> so now the sun is setting and my boy's in the dark. I'm like, I just feel so I'm going to say no. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think Jeff crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, I think you guys asked some good questions. It was cool to chop it up with you again. Maybe, uh, maybe sometime soon we can try to get a workout in together. Like, I don't know. It'd be cool if you came over to Canada once things settle down, Eric. It'd be fun to train together. So all, all, all due respect to, to New Zealand, uh, not throwing any shade, but we did so well handling COVID. Uh, that now there is no COVID in New Zealand. So we don't seem to be quite as motivated to distribute vaccines as other parts of the world. Let's just say that. Okay. Yeah. So while maybe maybe you guys have like 40% of of the uh, the population getting doses, we have about 4%. 4%? No way. So no, Is that due basically. to availability or just hesitancy though? Must be available. No, no, it's not hesitancy. It's it's like the, the planned rollout was, okay, we're going to do the border workers, then we're going to try to get this trans-Tasman bubble, and then we're going to start distributing. And in July, we'll start getting to the, like the general population that is in the high risk or health worker categories. And, you know, then we'll finish by end of year. So I'm just, all of us are kind of like, you know, we wouldn't have to 
maintain all this border security if we just were all vaccinated. But sure, sure. Maybe next year. Yeah, that's probably the earliest, realistically. 2022. The retirement year. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to have a retirement party. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, you too can just rest on your laurels and just put out a podcast once a week. Trust me, it's a good life. <laughs> Is it nice? And be moderately re relevant. It, it's working thus far a year late. Like, let's see how long you could do it. Nice. Nice. Right. Well, awesome, dude. I appreciate your time. Thank you for, for, for starting with us from sunup to sundown out there. And uh, Omar, <laughs> I'm going to kick it over to you, my man. Yeah, I mean, I would love to link Jeff's social media, but quite frankly, if you don't know who Jeff is, like we, you've just completely missed the boat. This is, this is once again like having a uh, name, name a, a particularly huge uh, pop star, and have then them fe <laughs> being featured on your album, and you're like an independent artist, and they're like, but wait, who's this? Like, who's you two? Who's you two? You're like you two is being featured uh, on your song. It's like okay, I don't know where to begin, but I want to thank Jeff for being on. Uh, hopefully, it won't be two years uh, until we have you back on again. Jeff's like, let me look at my busy ass schedule, and also you told me it would take an hour and a half. It's now almost three hours. Uh, we will link his social media in the description. You could help us out by just completely gamifying the algorithm by leaving a rating and review on iTunes because we are beholden to them and what you say for our corporate or, uh, overlords, the corporate cabal that basically rule iron <laughs> culture. We say we sit atop the pyramid, but folks, remember in ancient Egypt, there were in fact gods. Who do you think we sacrificed to? Why, of course, Osiris, but Osiris is now known as Skype. Um, so go ahead, leave a, a rating and review, and we'll catch everyone on that next episode every single Monday.